Indianapolis. In existence since 1909, it is the original Speedway, the first racing facility so named. Much has happened in its 103 years, and today, more history will be made with the inaugural running of the Brickyard Grand Prix. Which of these drivers will enter Indy Immortality, alongside other first-time Indianapolis winners, all legends? Ray Haroon, Jeff Gordon, Michael Schumacher, and Valentino Rossi. For Rolex Series drivers, teams, officials, and fans, today marks the fulfillment of a dream. Grand Am takes center stage at one of the grandest venues in all of motorsport, and it very well could be one of the wildest races this place has ever seen. It's round nine of the 13 round Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. But for today, the focus is on the finale of the lucrative North American Endurance Championship, coupled with the exciting fact it's the first ever sports car race meeting at the famed Brickyard. And that's why the superstars of the sport are here. Nobody turns down the opportunity to race at Indy. As Speed welcomes you to the Brickyard Grand Prix. It's round three of the North American Endurance Championship presented by VisitFlorida.com at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And as you see, uh, wet scenes here at the Speedway. Hi, folks. Lee Diffie, Dorsey Schrader, Calvin Fish. It's a real treat for us to say for the first time in this series, welcome to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. We've got a very busy afternoon and evening coming up, guys, because we're with you here right and through till 7.30 p.m. Eastern. After that, Adam Alexander with Speed Centre. Then we've got Trackside from here at the Brickyard. And then we've got the Arca Series race from just down the road. So we've got a lot happening. For those of you who have uh, watched Grand Am for a long time, you've heard us refer to the DP or Daytona Pro prototype era. We're now in our 10th year of racing Daytona prototypes in Grand Am. We've had the fortune and, and uh, fun of visiting many of North America's top venues, but I don't think any of us ever thought this day would come. It's big for the series. It really is. It's a special day for me calling the race over the yard of bricks for you and Dawes. It's going to be very cool. And for the drivers, many of whom were young go-kart drivers when they thought of racing at the Indianapolis Speedway, for others, they watched their fathers race here at the Indy 500. It's a special day. They need to put that to one side right now. It's mm -hmm. time to execute this race. It's going to be a tough race. They need to think about there are championships on the line. There's the North American Endurance Championship, first-time winners for that. And also, Dorsey, they'd love to be the first-time winners here at Indy. There's a lot of pressure on these guys out there today. A lot of pressure. Not about it. And think about this, for the sports car guys, a one-day show. They had to unload this morning two races. They had to go out there and practice. They had to qualify, and now they have to race. They have to do that with drivers making no mistakes whatsoever. And the crew, they better have the car right because there's no time to change anything now. Oh, and throw into that some uh, bad weather. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll, well. we'll talk about that in just a moment. As we do each and every round, we encourage you to join the conversation via Twitter. Remember, hashtag GA on speed. There are our respective Twitter handles. We'd love to hear what you think of the very first Rolex Series race at the Brickyard. You know, we're really proud to say this. One of our speed members raced at the Indy 500 in 1994. It's Brian Till. Brian? Oh, thanks, Lee. You know, it brings back a lot of memories coming here to the Speedway. I hadn't been here in a long time, and to step back in pit lane is pretty special. No one wants to win here worse than the man sitting on the pit stand back behind me, and that is Scott Pruitt. He's won more Rolex Series sports car championships than any other driver. He's raced here at the Speedway in both NASCAR and in IndyCar. He wants to add his name to the top of the list of Rolex sports car drivers to win here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But if he's going to do it, he's got some stiff competition to get by, not just regulars, but guys that visit as well, take a look at this list. Juan Pablo Montoya, Scott Dixon, Jamie McMurray, all three of those drivers have won here at Indianapolis. They're pretty fast in Daytona prototypes as well. What about Sebastian Bourdais and Paul Tracy? IndyCar champions, they're in the field today. The competition is stacked, and it's regular drivers as well. You talk about history coming into this deal. Think about this history. Alex Gurney is trying to add his name to the list of winners at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, something his father was never able to do as a driver. But Alex Gurney, if he could win here, it'd be the first thing for a Gurney win. Now, Dan did win here as both a car constructor and an entrant, but he never won as a driver. 
more history to be made, David Donahue. If he could win, it would be 40 years after his father won here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He did the same thing a few years ago with his Rolex 24 victory 40 years after his father's win. A lot of history yet to be made here from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway here today, Lee. Isn't it terrific to say that those names, Donahue and Gurney, are back at the Speedway. If you're with us at Watkins Glen, you'll remember that we're talking about a championship within a championship. The big picture is the Rolex Sports Car Series. We've got a three-round championship called the North American Endurance Championship, and today is the finale. Remember the Rolex 24, the six hours of the Glen, and here at the Brickyard are the three rounds that make this championship up, and it's pretty tight in both classes in Daytona prototype and in the GT class. We saw a massive swing in points at the six hours of the Glen. You can see the GT points up on screen there. Speaking of GT, it's time to say hi to Chris Neville. Yeah, Lee, and $50,000 on the line in that North American Endurance Championship at NGT. It's Stevenson Motorsport that is currently leading that championship. They've brought out a second car. Since this is a team championship, they want valuable points, so that's why they brought the second car out this weekend. And it's the anchorman of this team, Robin Liddell, who's going to start today in the 57 car, and he's trying to follow in the footsteps of fellow Scotsmen, Dario Franchitti and Jim Clark, who have won here. He's trying to be the winner of the inaugural Brickyard Grand Prix. But also in this class, we've got lots of stars just like the Daytona prototype class we've got Patrick Dempsey out there we've got NASCAR rookie of the year 2011 he drove here last year in the Brookyard 400 Andy Lally he finished 26th and then there's Boris said one of the favorites in NASCAR but our sports car driver he's also here and then we've got GT stars Bill Arbelin and your Bergmeister Bergmeister who's won here twice in Porsche Super Cup we've had five GT manufacturer winners this year maybe we'll have a sixth today and you heard Chris there mention $50,000 up for grabs for the GT competitors in the North American Endurance Championship. $100,000 on the line for the teams in Daytona prototypes. What are they competing for? Not only the cash, but this beautiful trophy created by Inspire Bronze of Deland, Florida in conjunction with Humphreys and Sun Jewelers. It is a beautiful piece. Who's going to get it? We'll find out later. Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is presented on speed by Rolex. Brought to you in part by Subaru. Experience the confidence of symmetrical all-wheel drive. Moment in the history of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series and the Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge that yesterday afternoon, literally hundreds of drivers from both championships were out on the front straight, assembled right near the most famous yard of bricks in the world for a group photo. And then earlier today, both the Rolex Series cars and Continental Series cars went out onto the track there were in excess of 100 sports cars on this track for a facility that's been racing for over 100 years. It was very appropriate. Just some really terrific scenes here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. We're going to talk weather because the pictures are telling you a story. We realize that we've just had a Continental Tire Series race that was affected severely by the weather. There has been a, uh, a uh, national weather warning for this area of severe winds. We have seen extreme lightning and we have had rain. This is the second dose of rain today in the last couple of hours. So uh, race control are monitoring the situation and the weather very carefully. We want the drivers to have the safest possible conditions. Dorse, I know you're excited to do this because you do this each and every race. Tell us where we are and tell us a little bit more about this famed facility. Well, thanks to Google Earth, we're going to go right down through the clouds to Indianapolis <laughs> Motor Speedway, IMS. And, of course, this is a road race course that we will run on today. Some 13 corners, two and a half miles in length, a little bit longer than that. That infield is very, very slippery, and now it's wet. And, of course, the banking, that gives them 26 seconds of full throttle acceleration. We want to congratulate our respective class pole sitters. Qualifying was a little earlier today. As you heard Dorsey mention, it's unload, it's practice, and then qualify. John Fogarty in the 99 Gainsco Bob Stallings Corvette on the pole, and for speed source in the Mazda RX-8, Jonathan Bomarito. 
And that's certainly a moment those two gentlemen will never forget, grabbing the poles at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Subaru starting grid will roll in at the top of your screen. You can see who is starting where in both classes and who their co-drivers are for this inaugural race at the Brickyard. Now, as the cars roll at a pretty slow pace, they're going to be watching and taking everything in on these pace laps to see where the standing water is, where can they go, where can they find some grip. We've got some onboards for you as well. Take a look inside the 01, one of two. Chip Ganassi with Felix Sabatis entries here today. The 01 and the 02, we'll tell you more about that. The 5 Corvette, one of two Action Express cars. The 10 Corvette, Wayne Taylor's team and Max the Axe Angelelli behind the wheel. And then the 77 Ford Delara for Kevin Doran's team with Dr. Jim Lowe and Paul Tracy is back at the Speedway. Doesn't that feel good to say? It really does. Uh, many believe that he won here. We'll talk about that during the course of the show, the Indy 500. Ultimately, that day was Elio Castro Nevis, but Paul welcomes a return here to the Speedway. Time to take you to the Continental Tire. Keys to the race, and it's three simple points but three very important points. Cal, if you would, walk us through them. Well, Starstruck, we talked about it in the open, Lee. You can't afford to think about the magnitude of this event. You've got to execute your race. This racetrack, a split personality. Dorsey talked about it. Long, fast straightaways here. 26 seconds, you're wide open throttle. Then you get to that end field that's very slippery, very tight. And a long road, pit lane here, costs you 39 seconds by coming down pit lane at 45 miles an hour versus staying on the racetrack. 39 seconds is the cost it will give to the team. So they have to think about that in the strategy you really need to be leading or close to the lead to maintain the lead lap when you hit pit lane with service today. All right, so we continue these pace laps, running at a slow pace, taking a good look. One guy who's going to have a very careful look, but he knows how to run this track in the opposite direction, is a Brickyard 400 winner, Jamie McMurray. Let's hear from him. Yeah, Lee, it was Jamie McMurray who qualified the 02 car earlier today, but slight change in the driver rotation. Jamie McMurray standing behind the wall now. Scott Dixon in the car. Jamie, with that change, you guys did it because you've never raced in the rain before, and you didn't want to have to take the green flag. Yeah, we were watching the weather really close uh, before the start of the race, and it, it looked like you might get some laps in before the rain hits, but literally I got in the car and I drove it out here, and it, uh, it started pouring rain. So it's going to clear off now. Um, it certainly has changed our strategy, I think, for the whole race. And I believe they're up there trying to figure out what we're going to do now. Um, all of our driver changes we practiced were with me just getting out. So um, it sounds pretty easy at home, I think, to, when you think about the driver change. But it's, it's, it's difficult to do it in the amount of time with the fuel. Um, and you're just not used to doing and you got to think about that driver change. If Jamie does go in that middle section, Juan Pablo's going to have to follow up, and Juan Pablo Montoya a lot bigger than Jamie McMurray, so they might have a problem with the belts on that last stop. Great to have Jamie Mack back in a Daytona prototype in the Rolex sports car series. We've seen him at the Rolex 24 before, and to have he and Scott Dixon and Juan Pablo Montoya in a car, what a dynamite trio. Well, I think when JPM gets behind the wheel, it'll be amongst the pigeons there. And remember, there's a lot on the line here, particularly with this North American Endurance Championship. But Jamie brought up a very important point. They practice their driver changes in a certain rotation, and he never practiced getting in, just getting out, because he was supposed to start this race. That will have a factor, even though he did run the 24-hour Daytona this year, Dorse. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot going on when you have to do a driver change, and then add to that the rain. Now we've got windshield wipers have to be dealt with, and also visibility. Some of these cars have defoggers at work. Some of have an electric windshield, a heated windshield, but whatever you have, it better work, and your driver better know where all those switches are located. There have been some competition adjustments. We'll talk more about that and articulate those once we get into the meat of the race. One of them affected this championship leading FXDD Ferrari. Emil Asentado is behind the wheel, the co-championship leader. His teammate, as always, is Jeff Siegel. He's standing by with Brian. Well, Lee, as you say, uh, Jeff and Emil lead the championship in the GT category. First of all, let's talk about competition adjustments. Uh, spacer in the fuel rig here, that should slow down your fill. How big of a change is that going to be for you guys? You know, it's surprisingly, it's a very large change. You would think that the off-track stuff isn't as important as what makes the car go quickly, but uh, on pit lane, it's, it's a fierce battle, and, you know, one or two seconds of refilling time makes a difference of five or six positions. So um, right now, I'm not sure we're entirely happy with where we are, but 
you know, all season we've kept focus on the on track. We haven't let the politics distract us. You know, this is no different. It's a challenge. Hopefully we'll overcome it. And uh, we're looking for uh, hopefully victory lane at the end of the day. Well, let's talk on track really quickly. Emil out there, what kind of Continental tires are on that Ferrari right now? Some teams out on slicks. Some on rain tires. What are you guys on? We're on wets. I think you'd have to be pretty brave to be on slicks right now. And, uh, you know, with where we sit and the way this championship is, brave is not in our vocabulary. Patient is and safe is. So, you know, hopefully that'll be the right call. It'll kind of depend on how this weather evolves here, but it's really an unknown. We haven't been on the, uh, the infield road course in the rain. So, you know, it's a guessing game for everybody. One of the Star Wars Daytona prototypes on pit road just moments ago doing a tire change. It's going to be a gamble, guys. If you've got a very detailed eye, you would have just seen a green flag waved with a yellow below it. So the race has officially started and it's a three hour event at the Brickyard here today. So the clock is running and that's all important because this is a time certain event. With the yellow out, that is a demand flag, meaning that you cannot pass. So essentially the pace car will lead these guys around until they deem it drivable. Right now, the water is too deep in some areas. We've been here before this year, Cal, Homestead Miami Speedway. <laughs> <laughs> we had to have our, uh, our galoshes, our Wellington boots out that day, and that was a rain-shortened event. We're feeling more optimistic about it here because the weather has been moving through at a pretty rapid rate. We're live here from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. You're experiencing it as we are, and good to see the circuit bathed in sunshine. There's a guy who has somewhat of a checkered past here at this raceway, but boy, are we pleased to have him in the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. PT, Paul Tracy is in the house. Yeah, Paul Tracy, but here. running the oval all those years and coming up just short in 2002, that controversial finish, but doing it different this weekend. You're running the road course. What's that like? Well, it's a first for everybody. Uh, obviously, when it goes yellow here, they immediately wave the yellow. So it's going to be a first time for everybody here on the track at Indianapolis to run the road course. You're half the track is the oval in the rain. It's going to be real tricky, the, the first last corner, which would be turn one Indy. Well, Paul Tracy running part-time this year in the Rolex series. But lots of rumors out there circulating that he's going to be here full-time full in 2013. Well, as Paul mentioned, it is going to be really tricky. I mean, there is a really a high-speed corner coming back onto the speedway and uh, going to really keep these guys on their toes. The downforce in the Daytona prototypes is a lot stronger, so that will stick these cars to the road. But for the GT drivers, they're really going to be dancing around there, Dorsey. Yeah, and then, like I said before, the visibility is a big, big issue, more so with the GT cars because the engine's forward of the windshield, and, of course, the headers get all that water on it, it turns to steam, and then you've got a no visibility, which is the worst situation. So, technically speaking, we are up and running. The race has started, but we're going to continue to run under these pace laps and caution laps, I should say, just until the track gets to a safe enough position to go racing for real. We're going to squeeze in a break. See you on the other side. Grand Am at the Brickyard. What a day. racing for the first time here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and contact there between the Wayne Taylor machine and also the Spirit of Daytona Corvette up and running in really tricky conditions. Boys, be careful. Yeah, there was some contact there. Garcia nearly got sideways in the bright blue Spirit of Daytona number 90. Here we see the Starport entry driven by Max Angelelli who qualified this machine. Now going side by side, look at this. Rojas down to the inside. Look at the grip around the outside for Garcia. Oh, oh they touch. None. There's none. Garcia oh. turns it around, gets into the side of Rojas, and then the two car as well. Two did we lost. just say be careful, Dos? Yeah, well, that didn't last long, did it? Lost a lot of body parts in there. Most of that was aero bits, I think. As the two run around cars. the outside, Dawson looking for grip. Offline, there's a bit more grip in these wet conditions. The track is not as smooth, doesn't have that rubber or oil laid down. So in the wet, you run the wet line, as they call it, around the outside, but Garcia pushed it a little too hard. That was great work from Max Angelelli right there in the Starport number 10 Corvette for Wayne Taylor Racing. He had one on the inside in Mabo Rojas. He had Alex, Gar uh, uh, rather, uh, Antonio Garcia on the outside. This is the damaged car of Garcia. A lot of aero damage when you consider these cars will run 190 right close to that down the straightaway. That's going to have to be addressed. 
This is where it's going to be here, here, coming through the speedway section right here. High speed nature of the racetrack. You're just feeling it out. Do I have the grip here to push it? Typically, it's flat out in these Daytona prototypes. They have to tread carefully right now. John Fogarty leads the first flying lap at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for Grand Am. Rojas on the inside of Terry Borchella. Does Terry he did not there? qualify well at all, and he is making up for that right here, right now. He is. It was a disappointing qualifying run for Maymo this morning. Uh, boy, is he putting that to bed right now. That Ganassi car is hooked up. As we know, Dorsey, in these conditions, it's all about preparation. The Ganassi team typically has their driver in a scenario where they can see and also drive the car quickly. Lap ago. This is what happened. Garcia in the 90, Rojas in the 01. And I don't even think that oh, Angelelli touched I don't Garcia. Think he did. I think it just broke traction. It did. I think he was looking for grip there and it just suddenly broke away from him. Let's have a look here. We're on board. Look to your right there. Oh, no. He did get touched. Yeah, he got touched. Angelelli sure. got him right in the rear fence there, just behind the left rear wheel. And that's what turned him. And Take Alex Popov actually took the worst brunt of that as his car actually got airborne for a moment. Check these guys slipping and sliding. Doing a wonderful job. Terry Borchella had his hands full there in the five. And then the two of Alex Popov, then Angelelli. And then we go back to the number eight of Enzo Potolicchio to GT now. And Robin Liddell leads the way for Stevenson Motorsports. That's huge because Stevenson leads the North American Endurance Championship. And Robin himself is second in the Rolex Series points. This is a huge day for the Scotsman. Yeah, coming off that brilliant win in the last round, of course. And uh, this is a Scotsman. This is last summer's day over in Scotland, Dorsey. So he's feeling <laughs> at home right now. I thought about that, but you're right. Just got word from race control at the 64 TRG Porsche, driven by former F1 and IndyCar star Eliseo Salazar, is going to get a penalty for jumping the star. Well, they talked about it a lot in the driver's meeting here yesterday in terms of what you could do. You cannot initiate a pass. You can go side by side, but you can't have an acceleration run going. And Salazar has got so much experience here in the Indy 500 over the years, got a little bit wrong there and got caught. Take a look this at the number two car. That's the car that was involved, Alex Popov. We saw a lot of body parts fly, and those are usually aero bits that help with the front downforce on that car. But we've seen Alex in the rain before. He's quite good in the rain. Yeah, he's not scared. He, uh, he well, also Enzo Podolicchio put in a wonderful drive at Homestead Miami Speedway. Brilliant stuff. I mean, he was duking out with Richard Westbrook for the lead of that race, just doing a fantastic job. And uh, those two Venezuelan drivers no longer look like rookies. They're really performing. Well, Maymo Rojas has really put the foot down at the beginning of this race. He's chasing down his old arch rival John Fogarty. Tell us more about the 01 car, Brian. Lee, this race 15 minutes longer than a standard sprint race. Two, three hours instead of 245. And I don't know if Ganassi is already working fuel strategy or it's for traction reasons, but they're telling Memo Rojas to one, use one fuel setting on the infield and a different fuel setting for the oval portion of the racetrack. So right now, they're already trying to think about how to get the best performance out of the 01. Seems to be working well, Chris. Brian, two of the cars that caught up in that first lap accident, Enzo Potolicchio. That car seems to be doing fine, even though it got a little bit of airborne, just checked in with team owner Peter Barron. He gave me the thumbs up, said Enzo says that car is working well. Also checked in with Troy Fliss, team owner of Spirit of Daytona, the 90 car. He said Antonio Garcia, quiet on the radio right now, but you can see that bodywork damage up on the right front corner. That car probably not working through the oval turn one the way it did earlier. Yeah, my apologies to uh, Garcia on that one. I thought initially that he just lost control of the car. He did get that nudge from Angelelli there, Dorsey, on the opening lap. But uh, I really like that information from Brian about the Ganassi team. They were looking at 52-minute runs in the dry three-hour race. That means it's a four-segment, three-stop race. If they can stretch it to 60 minutes in these wet conditions by managing that fuel economy, that would be huge. Our pole sitter on the right-hand side there, the black master, Jonathan Bomarito, is under siege from the 31 of Boris Said. And then further back, you see the 59 and 73, a couple of Porsches there. Andrew Davis in the Brumos machine, 73, the Horton Autosport Porsche of Patrick Lindsay. Lindsay's won that little arm wrestle for the time being. Good scrap amongst two Porsche boys. 31 cars had problems really with their fueling system over the past couple of rounds. Kept getting a vapor log on at Dorsey and they really felt that the exhaust system was too close to the fuel cell causing them problems. So they made some adjustments there since the last round and Teddy Marsh, the team manager there for the 31 car, said I think we've got it fixed but we're not really sure. These conditions will certainly help that with these rain and uh, cooling everything down a little bit. Notice on the 31, the one single windshield wiper which only cleans half of the windshield but that's the half where Boris sits. He doesn't care much about that other side right now. Big slide off the 70. 
Boris has raced here in NASCAR Sprint Cup in the Brickyard 400. He knows what the Speedway's all about. He's never raced here on the infield, on the road course. Patrick Lindsay doing a phenomenal job as the lead Porsche in the race right now, currently running in the fifth spot. Fourth spot, make that. He's got around uh, Andrew Davis in the Brumos Porsche. These guys just feeling their way as these track conditions are changing by the lap. That was the 72 Grant Racing 901 shop Porsche that they're coming by there. Kevin Grant starting the car for that family entry there. Meanwhile, back up front, let's have a fight. Here we go. And this is Terry Borchella in the five. Clear. And he's clear. fending Look off from Look the inside. 60 Look of John Q. Now, Terry Look was a lot clear, higher clear, up clear. the order Good last job. time we saw him. Travel. We understand he's had a little bit of an off-track experience. Front air intake, the grill doesn't seem dirty. Maybe it was just a spin and a collect and go again. But he certainly dropped a lot of positions. The revised order is Fogarty, not quite a second ahead of Maymo Rojas. Alex Popov, Max Angelelli, and Enzo Potolicchio in the top five. Then Scott Dixon has made his way from the back of the DP field up to sixth. Darren Law, then Borchella and Pugh. That's how they run in DP at the moment as the sun starts to warm up and bathe the indianapolis motor speedway to dry things out in this three hour enduro it's a first for the grand am rolex sports car series glad you can be with us you're watching sports cars live on speed oh look at this here they're going they're bumping at it He is on the other side of the fence. No, no, no! They go wrong! If you're a regular viewer of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series, you know that's just a sample of what we've enjoyed over the past few years. There's no shortage of action, that's for sure, and these guys have been in the middle of it as well. The 99 Red Dragon, Bob Stallings, Gaines Co. Boys, two-time championship winners. Hey, there's lots going on here at the Brickyard, including Fast Friday action continues because trackside tonight at 8 p.m. They're going to have a very busy man in Sam Hornish Jr. and nationwide points leader Elliot Sadler on the show. They're going to have lots of giggles, lots of laughs. That's coming up right up to Speed Center tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on speed that's trackside let's go trackside john fogarty leading the way he's increased his margin traffic assisted over maymo rojas it's two rival teams gaines cohen ganassi running one two brian that lead seesaws back and forth and what the teams are talking about both the 99 and the 01 on the radio right now is conserving those continental rain tires that are on it john fogarty just said I know that there's a dry line developing, but it's still very slick on the infield. I still feel like I need those rain tires. But down the front straightaway, both he and Memo Rojas running to driver's right through the wet areas of the track, trying to keep those continental rain tires cool. If they overheat, they will begin to chunk and come apart. And these guys came so close to that win at Watkins Glen, eventually getting pipped there by Barbosa in the final half hour of the race. They're like a wounded animal, Dorsey, and that sometimes is dangerous. Absolutely. Seeing these guys now trying to search out water as the dry line that they're talking about, you can visibly see it's going to really chew up these full tread tires unless they can cool them in the water. This is the Chevron entry, the 02 of Scott Dixon, the 06 Rolex 24 winner. He's a two-time IndyCar champion, and for what's pertinent here, he's the 2008 Indy 500 winner. We've seen Scott each and every year at the Rolex 24. He just slots into these cars seamlessly. This time yesterday, he was testing his uh, target, team target IndyCar at Mid-Ohio, had a really productive run there. I asked team manager Tim Keane, does it matter Scott hasn't been in the car since Daytona? He said, hey, you're talking about Scott Dixon. He's plug and play. Exactly, and you can see the job that he's doing right now. Not taking any unnecessary risks, just getting back into the groove. He's got that 0-2 car up to the sixth spot and is running lap times within a few tenths of the leaders. So he's coming on strong and he'll just give good information to his teammates in terms of what the car is doing. They'll make some adjustments. They're going to be a factor here today. Remember, this is a team that has added a second entry trying to win this North American Endurance Championship, but there's no championship points on the line for these guys so they can roll the dice oh look at this the battle for the lead with the other oh, ganassi car rojas is clear. through on fogarty and oh, wow. this has been an inspiring drive from Maymo rojas who did not qualify well has his hands full there doors good catch but we've got a new race leader Buddy. 
A lot of aggression right there. Be cool in traffic. 90's gone back in with that damage to the front end. It might be more severe than just that body. Let's go to the Spirit of Daytona team. Let's hear from Troy Fliss. Well, Lee, more problems for this team. Obviously, that contact on the opening lap. But, Troy, what's going on with Antonio Garcia now? We just saw him go back into the garage. Yeah, we're going to go back to the garage. We think we broke the drive. We broke an axle or something in the gearbox. So we'll change it back in the garage. We'll be quicker to change it out here. So we'll change it back there, get Richard back in and get some points. Just a bad day. Gio came on board for this race, and uh, we wanted to have a good run. We had a great race car. I don't know why, what, what happened there, but we'll go back and uh, see what we got. Troy, really a hot and cold year for you guys. You get your first win in prototypes. You get two wins this year, but other times have just been extremely big struggles for you. What's it going to take to turn this team around? I don't know. It's, uh, we've, we've had some really bad fortune this year, and, uh, and just, you know, again, it's, we've had a team that can win a lot of races, and we're, we're really excited that we can keep winning races, and this is going to have to make us go try harder. But today, we, there's no reason for what just happened. I mean, it's just something that I don't know if it was a part failure or something. Um, we just got back from our trip on the road, and took us some time to, you know, rebuild everything, and everything was fresh for this race, and we had a lot of importance on it, so really sad. It's great to be here at Indy, but, uh, you know, we'll have to come get him next week. Well, co-driver Richard Westbrook currently sixth in the points, so they're trying to get that car back on the racetrack so Richard can come out of here with at least some points. Might have to ask or pose the question, why make a risky move like that in the wet on the opening lap? But speaking of a pass, let's take you back and relive the moment where Maymo Rojas got by the 99 of John Fogarty. This is how he did it. Coming down the front straightaway, Fogarty goes over there somewhat to get the wet onto those tires that are getting pretty hot, but neither way, either way, Rojas just slides it down the inside. There's a little bit of room there crossing that white line. And uh, Rojas makes a nice clean pass. And John Fogarty let that happen pretty much too. You saw once he realized that uh, Memo was in there, he just said, okay, I'll let that happen. And managing director of racing operations, Mark Raffoff, told these drivers in the driver's briefing, heading down there into turn one, I don't mind if you've got all four wheels inside that white line. There are cones there that didn't quite survive many laps anyway. <laughs> he said, but more, I want, to, I want to see respectful driving amongst you guys. It really narrows down into that corner. I don't want to see you taking each other out if you do there'll be penalties handed down yeah and i think that was trying to be interpreted by the drivers during that driver's meeting they weren't quite sure where the law would come down if they did make that move but there's a good clean pass by rojas no contact so it was a good clean maneuver and i think mark rafa is going to let him get away with that one but here we see fogarty he's not letting him go and uh, he's just going to try and keep the pressure on trying to save those wet weather tires he doesn't want to burn them down see if they get into their fuel window you're going to hear us talking a lot about wet weather tires, dry weather slicks. Brian, show us the difference. Well, here's a slick, a Continental Tire race slick. This is a rain tire. When we talk about burning down the rain tire, here's the problem. Rain tires, first of all, are very soft. You can see it's very easy for me to dig my fingernail in there. Also, they have these big blocks. As the track begins to dry, this soft rubber moves back and forth, and these tread blocks heat up a lot. And in fact, this is what will begin to separate from the carcass, and you'll tear up this rain tire. So when we talk about temperature, the problem is this tire, as soft as it is, needs to stay cool and wet. That's what it was designed for. When the sun comes out like it is right now, it begins to dry. This rain tire can really become a liability and not an asset anymore. Let's show you some interesting numbers from Continental Tire, the control tire supplier of the Grand M Rolex Sports Car Series. Six sets of tires for the DP and GTs. If you're a Truman A can drive one of the Pro-Am guys, you get an extra set, but 1,200 tires are processed by the Continental Tire engineers during the course of a race weekend. That's a lot of work. A total of 2,000 tires brought to the event for all different scenarios, particularly with this wet weather that was on the slate. And you may have noticed John Fogarty there getting racy, trying to make a move on Rojas. He's growing impatient. He's not enjoying sitting in second place because Angelelli in third has just set the fastest lap and is catching them quick. Let's switch gears to GT as they go by the 44 Magnus Porsche and show you what happened one lap ago. This is to team owner, team principal John Potter. Watch this. So up there in the banking and to take a look as the smoke starts coming off that left rear you'll see that in dirt tracks when the guy's really abusing the outside of a dirt tire with well, the same things happening with that rain tire it's starting to melt wow they don't like to see smoke they've seen smoke the last couple of rounds they burned down an engine at road america and then the cop caught fire this is a new chassis that's underneath this 44 skin here this weekend burnt it to the ground almost at watkins Glen. so it hasn't been a happy time in recent weeks not for a car and a team and a driver combination that at one point in this season were the championship leaders. Words from the pits as the 0-2 Dixon is in. Here he is. 
Well, is he going to be the first, first guy to make the move to slick tires? Let's wait and see. Yeah, he is, Calvin. The last couple acts, I've been listening to Scott Dixon and team manager Mike Hall talking about whether they should come in for slicks or not. Scott was just saying the car was squirming around quite a bit on these wet weather tires. So he was the one who made the call, want to come in for slicks. But as you look down pit lane, we've got a big puddle right in the middle of pit lane, right in the middle of that fast lane. So Scott is going to have to try and hug this white line where all the officials are standing right in the car out of that puddle. We told you at the Rolex 24 at Daytona earlier this year, the relationship between Mike Hull, the general manager of Chip Ganassi Racing, and Scott Dixon is so intimate. They know what each other are thinking before they even say it. They can tell by little inflections on their words, the way they're communicating to each other. They read each other. They've been working together so long with each other that it is such a tight relationship. Yeah, and that is something special to find in racing. And when you have that special relationship, that leads to success, Dorsey. No doubt about it. And there's something you can't buy. You have to sit there and spend time with one another to make that work. In GT, Liddell still leads set in the 31 here. Boris is doing well. Patrick Lindsay has put in a dynamic drive to get that Horton Autosport Porsche up into the top three. He just keeps going forward. We're going to go to a break, but we've got a whole lot more from the Brickyard. We're sharing the weekend this weekend at the Brickyard with NASCAR's Nationwide and Sprint Cup Series. We do the same on Saturday, August 11. It's the next round of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. It's the short course, short race, action-packed at the Glen. Watkins Glen, coming up in just two weeks' time. You can see it live at 6 p.m. Eastern, right here on Speed. We've just finished a brilliant six hours of the Glen, but we look forward to the next one, the short one. While we're in that last commercial break, there has been a variety of pit stops. That means Alex Popov has stayed out. He has inherited the lead of the race, and the two Starworks Riley Ford-powered cars are one and two in this race at the moment over Darren Law, John Pugh. John Fogarty and the Gainsco boys did a great pit stop. They leapfrogged the Ganassi 01, and then Max Angelelli and Wayne Taylor's guys at the Starport pit did a really good job to get Angelelli right back up onto Mamo Rojas, so it's tight. what happened just a few moments ago. This is the Ganassi stop for Memo Rojas. The reason they're switching to the slick tyres, Scott Dixon, when he made the change, went 10 seconds faster than the previous lap they had done on wet weather Continentals when he switched to these slicks. So you just got to be careful of the puddles, but the effectiveness of these slick tyres, particularly on that high-speed bank corner there, coming on the front straightaway, will be monstrous. Remember, the North American Endurance Championship rewards the best team, and that's what sports car racing is all about, teamwork. Look at it here, and there was a slight hiccup on the front right, and that was enough to allow the 99 to get out ahead. Let's find out what happened down at Ganassi, Brian. Well, sometimes races are won or lost on pit road, and that's exactly what happened here, even though the 0-1 has gotten back by the 99 on track. Problem with the right front lug nut the wheel nut on that stop it delayed the 0-1 the 99 able to jump him in the pits but the battle has continued after the racetrack well, a little bobble there sometimes this rain does see everything is gritty and a little bit more difficult to work with under these conditions that they've had for the first hour of this race being in these wet conditions even so they've recovered nicely rojas is on a charge that car is hooked up here today and they've left angelelli for in this dust a little bit he came out just a second or so behind them guys you know what happens sometimes is your brakes will get so hot and it'll heat up that the threaded part of the nut and then the nut on the outside of the wheel gets in the rain and it, it shrinks it gets down and it gets too tight in the meantime the 10 car was in as well we should say and max angelelli and the suntrust guys did a great pit stop chris For his stop getting slicks he will also stay behind the wheel sebastian for dave will be getting in this car a little bit later the team were just delighted with the job that sebastian bordet did for them in that car at the six hours of the glen here comes effectively what is the leader and second place in the race pop off is he going to be able to get out ahead of angelelli no is the answer the axe flies by. They held on a little bit too long. I mean, uh, Popov here ran the fastest lap on the wet tires during the course of this race so far, 133. Took back Dixon running the 29 first time on the slicks. But what they may be is a little bit better on fuel. Remember, it's all about trying to do this race now on three stops. The guys who stopped after 20 minutes, they're about 10 minutes out of that window, I think. The two car will be in good shape fuel, I think, over the rest of the field. Ooh. Ooh. This is the GT class leading car and driver. And 
Think about him and what it means, this Scottish driver to be racing at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, thinking about Jimmy Clark, thinking about what the reigning Indy 500 champion, Dario Franchitti, has been able to achieve here. The Scottish racing community is such a tight-knit little group. Think about Alan McNish, the late Colin McRae, World Rally champion. They're very proud of where they come from and what they've accomplished on a global level. And if Robin Liddell can get himself closer to winning this championship by winning here at the Brickyard today, that will be something to remember. Yeah, that would be phenomenal. He's really, uh, he watches the history of the sport. He'd love to follow in the footsteps of guys like Frank Keaty, like Jimmy Clark. But right now he's really making those wet tires work really well. You saw him fly by that Ferrari there, which I think has switched to the slick tires. So he's still making those wet tires be very effective around this infield. Watching number 70 Mazda, that's Jonathan Bamarito, second place in the GT categories. He's working traffic in front of him, or working with traffic in front of him. Darren Law in the nine there, he's just he's just trying to work his way through. Let's climb the board. Bomarito. First time a rotary has competed at the Indianapolis Motor <laughs> Speedway. There are so many firsts here today. That's what makes this event so much fun. Of course, they're looking at coming with a diesel-powered engine for the new GX class next year, so that could be a first as well. This is Liddell at the Stevenson camp and Chris Neville standing by. Now Robin Liddell doing what he can to try and improve in this overall championship. Sitting second there, but leading the North American Endurance Championship. A little bit of a debate on the radio between team manager Mike Johnson and Robin about whether Robin was going to get out of the car. Robin said, hey, let me just stay in here. We're going to let John Edwards finish this race. So Robin Liddell staying behind the wheel, giving the big job over to John Edwards today. We typically see Robin finish these races. But good stuff here. The team just finishing up the right front tire. And then they will drop the 57 and get him back out there. I like that call with Robin, too, to stay in the car right now. He knows what the racetrack grind conditions are. They're not going to catch him out on that. He was quick. He stayed out there longest with those uh, rain tires that are over anybody. Yeah, I mean, and John's a great talent, but to throw someone out there on slicks in tricky conditions like this, a lot of pressure on him. So I like the call as well, Dorsey. Here we see the championship leaders on pit lane. They haven't put a foot wrong all season long. Emil Asentano started the car, stays in the car. So while they service that, let's give you the rundown overall. Enzo Potalicchio leads the race in Daytona prototypes for Peter Baron Starworks, but he has not stopped what's happened to the 75 here. A spin. I think he just went straight down in turn one. That's been a problem. Matt Bell, that is behind the wheel. He's just oh, finished. locked Ooh. up. Big time Ooh. lock up. That's going to be a flat spot. Well, that might be Sucks even. throttle. Yeah, I think he might have a puncture. Yeah, I think there's something He's going on. He's got a lot of time pressure or something going on there, Brian. Five was back. It was five was in, I should say. You guys were talking about the car staying out the longest on rain tires. The 60 and the five just came in. Terry Borchell are the first of the drivers to get out. David Donahue has taken over the number five. Perhaps they were doing what you talked about, Calvin. Stretch that first stop as long as they can, and maybe they can do it on just two more. Yeah, I think that's the key factor there by passing that 30 minute mark. They should be able to do it on just two more stops. Here are the guys who had assumed the lead in GT when Robin Liddell made his pit stop. Bomarito, a great opening stint. And that's Sylvain Tremblay, Speed Source team principal, climbing aboard. And we understand that the race leader is in. This is Enzo Podolicchio, the last of the Daytona prototypes to stop. Chris? Yeah, really stretching those rain tires. Got about a 37 second lead right now. Going to give a lot of that up here in pit lane. Ryan DL getting behind the wheel. This team having two or three second place finishes this year. Almost grabbing that victory at the Rolex 24. But a real good stop. No problems with this car like we saw on the 10 and the 01 with the stop. But a little bit slow with the driver change here. A little slow. Oh, go, 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 go. go. And as we cycle back to the front, there's a, been a terrific scrap going on between John Fogarty and Maimo Rojas. Last time we checked in with them, Rojas was ahead. Now John Fogarty has got the Red Dragon up into the top spot, and he has a two-second margin over Rojas. Look at that. Rojas has now fallen into the clutches of Max Angelelli. The star Porsche Corvette is on a roll as Fogarty is running away. I mentioned it a little earlier in the show that it's a really full day and full weekend here in Indianapolis. Later tonight on Speed at 9 p.m. Eastern, it's the next round of the ARCA Racing Series from here in Indy. Look forward to it. It's live 
Rick Allen, Phil Parsons, the boys. Look at this fight for second. We told you about it when we went to break, but Angelelli was really starting to work over Memo Rojas. Rojas has now dropped 2.8 seconds in arrears of race leader John Fogarty, who is now working through traffic. And this is this is where Angelelli excels. He loves these door-to-door -door fights, this car-to-car -car combat. This is why we call him Max the Axe. This is where he makes those decisive moves. And they really have nothing to lose. I mean, the championship really is out of the picture for them this year. Four DNFs in a row. They're going to be going for race victories. They'd love to get it here. Indy, big contingent of fans here from the Starport people. Great to see their support on Wayne Taylor's machine here this weekend. And when Wayne Taylor formed Wayne Taylor Racing, many of his employees who work on this car are actually ex-Ganassi employees. Both these teams are literally based just up the road, both Indianapolis-based organizations. Rojas is still quick, looking at his lap times. He's running laps very similar to Fogarty. Fastest lap of this race has been set by Scott Dixon at 24.8. Rojas and Fogarty running 25 zeros, Dorsey. They're taking a look at the windscreen, windscreen right there and, and watch Memo Rojas's car as it makes these transition left to right. A lot of body roll. I don't know if he's got the sway bar up front at full soft still. See the body roll, uncharacteristic of that car. Fogarty's got his yeah. hands full too. Fogarty's in a little bit of trouble there yeah. as he had to work through traffic. Rojas has got a run on him here. This is a pretty long straightaway. Here we go. Look at that. Rojas looks to the inside. There's traffic there as well. Got to tread carefully. Big, better of it. big picture wise here, boys. His car in first, 99. The car in third to 10. They are no longer championship contenders. The car stuck in the middle is the championship leader. So 10 and 99 don't care about that 01. They just simply want race wins. They do. Look at that traffic again. Fogarty gets balked a little bit by that Audi trying to get on the acceleration. Here comes the 01 the 10 they've got to run on him they're going to tuck underneath We're him look at this what a move that's a great move from rojas now angelelli wants a shot at fogarty as well he was just sitting duck he got held up on the worst corner on the race trying to get held up on i love the commitment by the championship leader maimo rojas he didn't think twice about it he just died for the inside takes the lead of this motor race well he knew it right away didn't he, he saw it all happening it's happening again right now which side do you go? Where do you go? Angelelli has gone around Fogarty now. Uses the traffic to his advantage. And that's not pace. That's just the traffic, Dorsey. Playing a factor in this race right now. The neat thing was they realized that all three of them knew exactly what was about to unfold. When they got into that corner and the fresh car was bobbed, it was a handwriting on the wall. It was traffic that cost the 99 the victory at the sale in six hours of the Glen. And traffic is biting him again. What about this move? That was beautiful. That Audi there just stopped John Fogarty from having good acceleration up on the high-speed section of the racetrack. Rojas was through in the flash, and here comes Angelelli side by side down the front straightaway. And for John Fogarty, nothing he could do. He was a sitting duck on that one. That's the kind of move you'd expect to see from Juan Pablo Montoya. Hey, speaking of JPM, he's with Chris Neville. Well, Juan Pablo Montoya has raced here in NASCAR Sprint Cup. Formula One also won the Indy 500. And after today, the only thing left is MotoGP. So any chance we'll see you race here in that? No, no, no. I think it's great. You know, it's great to be here. You know, Chevron car is running pretty good. And we're running fourth right now, so we'll see. A little bit of change in driver rotation. It was initially going to be Jamie Mack, Scott, then you. What's the plan now? Well, you know, we left Jamie at the middle because it was raining. He has very little experience in the rain, so they decided to put Texan to start. And... And I don't know what's the order. If they tell me to get in, I get in. If you're going to follow Jamie Mack, any concern about that change? No. Jamie's been doing a really good job here. Uh, he's been, you know, been a lot more competitive. Like in the 24, he's always been very conservative. Here, he's been pushing. He's been doing a really good job. Now he's watching the O2 car chase down these leaders, and he's pretty excited about getting behind the wheel. Just fabulous to have JPM here, and what a landmark occasion it is for him. There is not a driver in the world who has done what he has done at this racing facility. Formula One, as Chris mentioned, IndyCar, sports cars, and NASCAR Sprint Cup. Really special. PT is behind the wheel of the M&M's Delara. Paul Tracy, back at the Brickyard. He's loving sports car racing. He really feels that he can extend his career by making the move to the Rolex Series. He loves the level platform that it provides in terms of the competitive field. And uh, he believes that his IndyCar days are now over, and he's focused really hard on trying to get a full-time ride for next year. He's taken over from jo Dr. Jim Lowe as he builds to speed. Rojas, Angelelli, Fogarty, the top three. They're blanketed by just four seconds. Then Dixon has worked his way up into the top four. Popov is five, Law is six, Dial is seventh, Donahue eight, and Negri is in nine.
Got to point out that this is a Generation 2 Daytona prototype. The rest of the field are running the new current Generation 3 car that was launched this year. So this car will have a little bit of a deficiency in the aero department, but problems for the leader, the 01. Roas is around down in turn one. Did something go on Both with Angelelli? Right, Were they that close that there may have been contact? Or did Mamo do it all by himself? No visible scars on the car doors. Don't see a thing on the car, and that's a place where you could easily get it wrong, coming off that banking and down into the turn one in that brake zone. He'd been pushing really hard. He seemed to be struggling to get up to speed there a little bit. Remember, you've got to work with that brake bias as well when you switch from the wet conditions to the dry. Here we see it. Now he's just in really deep, trying to go down the inside of the 60 car. Oz Negri just gets it wrong as Negri takes the line away. Let's take a look. He makes his move to the inside, but as he gets closer to the corner, he has to turn more and brake more, and that's not a good combination. Whoa. Negri was really fast here this morning, the second fastest car on the racetrack in the morning practice, so I think maybe Mamo expected the 60 car to be a little bit slower on the entry. Negri just took it in there, and Mamo had to jump on the binders. To Brian Till. Brian? And the Mike Shank Racing Team is not going to give up a victory here very easily, but as far as Memo Rojas goes, he's been on the radio a lot with Timmy Keene over the last several laps. About three or four laps ago, he said the balance is good, maybe a little bit pushy. Just one lap ago, he said starting to get a little bit loose. Maybe that's what we saw down in turn one, especially as he had to tighten his hands at the entry, just like Dorsey said. It's a huge day for Michael Shank Racing because they won the Rolex 24 at Daytona. They won $100,000 for that if they could win the North American Endurance Championship. It'd be another 100000 Boy, that was close. It was really close to contact there, and I think he just miscalculated the speed of the 60 car going down into turn one. He thought he had the inside line, but Negri just released the brakes, rolled it through the speed through the corner. Maybe we had to stay on the brake pedal as he was turning. Updating you on GT as we go to the break. Robin Liddell still in charge. Patrick Lindsay on the charge. That Porsche driver has got that Horton Autosport machine. Pass Boris set into second. Sylvain Tremblay and Dane Cameron round out the five. What a race this is shaping up to be. Middle of the GT pack, contact. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Got him now. Got him. Clear, clear. There he goes inside. Oh, oh. Move. what a move. That was fantastic. And it's Corvette versus Corvette. I think Barbosa's got enough to the line he has. Action Expresser in victory lane. Barbosa and Law, their first victory in this classic event. They came into this North American Endurance Championship round two, I believe, in fifth spot. And that is huge. Those guys went from the back of the pack in the North American Endurance Championship to the top. Action Express leads the way by two points over Starworks. Here in this event, you get 20 points for the win, 16 for second, 12 for third, and the rest, it doesn't really matter. And points were scored at the Rolex 24 at Daytona, the Salem six hours of the Glen, and here, the three-round North American Endurance Championship for the first time. And in GT, Stevenson did a very similar thing, just a massive leapfrog with that victory in upstate New York. Yeah, they're in great shape. They finished first or second here today. They're going to clinch, and uh, in the DP, any of the top four if they win that's pretty much enough the 99 cars an outside shot they need to win but other things need to happen for that to fall into place for them now we are under a full course caution in this race remember we started under caution due to the weather this however is an incident involving the 64 trg porsche with lsao salazar behind the wheel and just could not did not have enough momentum to get out of that gravel trap let's show you what happened to the former F1 star, former IndyCar driver. Drops two wheels off in the dirt and loses traction on that end of the race car. Locks it down, does everything right, but the gravel trap also did its job. It does, just got it wide out of turn five, and that's the turn six braking area, and uh, obviously you can see him off, and there's, he's not going to go anywhere. Takes one of this heavy machinery to uh, get it pulled out of that. For those of you who enjoy watching Formula One on speed, uh, a couple of rounds from now will be the... Um, round at Spa Francochamps and this man here, Alessio Salazar, will be a guest steward. You know, the FIA rotates and has guest stewards. Alessio is really looking forward to that. 
And he's also one of the few drivers, he believes he's the only driver in the world to have competed in F1, IndyCar, World Rally, the Dakar Rally, Le Mans, and the Rolex 24. Pretty cool, pretty remarkable record. And a really gentleman, he's a really nice guy. Great to have him back. All right, let's catch you up with the news and notes since we saw you a month ago. There have been some changes within the competition side at uh, and additions, I should say, uh, on the Grand Am staff side of things. We welcome Richard Buck and Gabrielle Kadringer uh, to the team and their important roles in the competition department and also the technical and rules side. We've got some new cars coming as well. Yeah, it looks like the Lotus Evora will eventually make its way into the GX class next year. It may in fact run in the GT category at the end of this year and there may be two Taylors in the DP field at Watkins Glen. Uh, Jordan Taylor joined the 10 team for a run in the test here. Uh, a couple of weeks ago and he in fact got some more seat time just last week at a tire test at Watkins Glen also. So as per Grand Am Rolex Series rules, first time by under caution, Daytona prototypes get the first shot at pit road. Let's go there with Chris Neville. Last minute call to bring Max Angeloli in. Initially they were going to leave him out on the racetrack but they decided to bring Max in. They're going to leave him behind the wheel and they're going to go with tires that he ran on in qualifying. Also the 0-2 in and it doesn't look like they're doing a driver change down there. It looks like Scott Dixon staying behind the wheel in the 0-2. Brian. Scott Pruitt will climb in behind the wheel in 0-1. Memo Rojas is out. Four new Continental tires. Smoko Fuel. Great stop by the 0-1. And they needed a great stop because how costly was that spin for Rojas? He went from first to sixth and lost a lot of track position. This caution obviously helping his cause. Yeah, I think we've got a couple of cars that are on the back end of the lead lap in front of Angelelli. There is the, the rest of the field stream out. So I think Angelelli should reassume the lead of this race unless someone stay there. I'm not aware of just yet. So Angelelli, Rojas, great start there. The 99 in third. Brian, we can't see clearly because the windows on our commentary booth are tinted, but it just feels like it's getting incredibly darker. What's happening weather-wise? Well, I need my big blue screen so I can show you the map and where the frontal system is coming <laughs> from. Yeah, but I don't have that. But I, what I can tell you is I'm looking up at the sky, and it has been coming from the west, northwest, all day long. And there are more showers in the background that I can see over the grandstands off the front straightaway. I don't see anything imminent. It actually looked a little more threatening before, but still, I, if we can get through this thing without another shower, I'm going to be surprised. So we'll keep a watchful eye on the skies above, and in just a few moments, we're going to go racing again. Grand Am at the Brickyard. So glad to be here. Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is brought to you by eHarmony.com, where first dates have a better chance of becoming something more. And by Chevrolet and their award-winning cars, trucks and crossovers. And as we welcome you back, rain starts to <laughs> fall at the Speedway. But first, need to tell you and remind you about NASCAR Race Hub presented by Ram Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 Pacific, here on Speed. Elliot Saddle, Larry Mack, Matt Clark, they will break down all the action from Indianapolis and the Brickyard 400 weekend. That's NASCAR Race Hub Monday at 6 Eastern, only on Speed. Brian Till, what were you just saying? If we could get through this race be, uh, without another shower, you would be very surprised. Uh, I'm being showered on right now. I don't know if you can see me or not, but um, yeah, it's wow. uh, it's raining. Hard. Hard. <laughs> have you got the right gel in your hair today, Brian? It's going to turn to granite. Well, this looks like the rainfall that we saw a little earlier in the Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge Series race. What it, would you do, Cal? <laughs> head for pit lane? Uh, I tell you what, I would. I would, too. You're not going to survive long. I'm no, I'd be headed straight in. This is crazy. I tell you, who did a great job as the 60 team. They were nearly a lap down. Remember when Rojas spun? Yeah. Tried to go with the inside of the 60. Well, somehow Max Schenk has worked some magic because Negri pitted on the same lap as everyone else, and he's now running in third in line. So that was some magic, which I don't understand how they managed to perform that in case it was, unless it was just a splash and they leapfrogged everyone because of that. But great job by Mike Schenk. And of course, they've got that North American Endurance Championship in there. Oh no! Oh, no. oh, just clips it into the into the side of yeah. the pit wall. Oh, that is sideways. Look at that. That's how slippery it is, guys. That's why these guys have to come in and get these slick tires off, even at 45 miles an hour. Robin Adele cannot keep that car under control. This is a huge second in the championship right now, leading the North American Endurance Championship. 
Was there any damage right, to that so Camaro? Doing so slow. Let damage on the left, rear and the left front. I'm I don't sorry. think he heard it. But I'll tell you what. So slow. It's like black ice. I mean, he just hit that and it was over, gone. Wow. That was a lucky break if he got away with it. Well, check that left side in a very detailed fashion. Chris is standing by. Tell us more. Well, before Robin Liddell got in the pit box, he said, hey, guys, we've got damage at the left front and the left rear. Team manager Mike Johnson saying, guys, let's take our time on this. With this rain, we don't have to be quick, so let's make sure we get this thing fixed right before we go back out of the racetrack. This is going to have major implications. Oh, we've got a big problem in the left rear. Crew member who was working over in that corner just came up, said, do not drop the car. So we've got some suspension components that are broken in that left rear. Huge implications in this uh, North American Endurance Championship. But remember, they also have the sister, sister car, the 75 out there, still in the fight. Well, and for Robin, independently, it's huge for him in the drivers championship in the GT ranks how quickly things can get away from you and he was explaining to Mike Johnson I was going so slow let's show you a replay and you look to the bottom of your screen just hoping this hit wasn't you can see hard. it's just sideways right there look at that slap slap it yeah oh, oh you can see yeah, he broke a tie oh yeah tie he's, link yeah it's gone big time Wow. Remember at Montreal when they won in the rain there, we saw some brilliant sideways catches by Robin Liddell, but today that pit wall just bit him. Kevin O'Connell just had an incident in the Rick Ware Racing Mustang. Also, we have got a replay for you. And conditions mirroring what I told you about just a few moments ago during the Continental Race earlier this afternoon where we had so much standing water. Let's show you what happened. Oh, this is the 64 again. Yeah, it's just like ice. If you're on slicks right now in these conditions, it is literally like an ice oh, ring. Oh, 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 oh. Nothing you can do. No, that was way up in the straightaway in the yeah. brake zone. Yeah. And watch you here. Can get, you can get it wrong just doing a downshift wrong. There you see a DP getting sideways right behind him. And then they're just taking it very, very gingerly. Thank you to the fans for being so resilient. I'll tell you what, these conditions, they're pretty much undrivable right now be surprised if we don't see now this is what happened to that Rick Ware racing Mustang there goes the 64 TRG car but it's got no grip I mean he's trying to get the thing slowed down to turn he's just got no grip on slick tires in these conditions you cannot go slow enough like Rob Liddell said I was going so slow you cannot believe you have to literally be crawling Dorsey we've ever experienced conditions like this remember Sebring one year yeah. we were stuck out there together you just can't believe how easy it is to get it sideways. Once the water gets up underneath there and it lifts the car up, you're just literally like on ball bearings. There's nothing you can do from a driving standpoint. Watch this. Look at the standing water on the inside there. And we are now back under full course caution. Look at the 88, the Auto House Camaro. Yeah, he just needs to ease up. I mean, these guys are being crazy here under the yellow. He just needs to back off the pace. That was Jordan Taylor there and was right near. Oh, and we've got two cars. That's the Brumos Porsche, is it? Or is it the Horton Autosport Porsche? Look at this. These guys are in third spot. Oh my. So crazy conditions here at the brickyard. And it was standing water that caused the race to be stopped in the Continental uh, event earlier this afternoon. 72 is just spun. I don't think it hit the rail. You see the marks going over by the by the guardrail there. Kevin Grant is behind the wheel. Meanwhile, the 57 and Stevenson Camaro still stationary on pit road for that collision with the wall. What a shocker this is. Mm. Yeah, having the perfect day to that point. Leading the race, controlling it. Decided to make the call. It was too slick. And then the irony of crashing on the pit entry. Leading the race and leading the North American Endurance Championship for GT. That has now escaped them. Look at the water raining down inside the car. That's going to get all over the electronics inside there's something they don't like focus you have to have in these conditions is just remarkable you just have to really ramp up dorsey yeah you gotta afford be... to relax for one tenth of a second it's really hard i mean you're working mentally so much harder than you are in a dry condition that you're just getting really tired quickly with a focus on jeff siegel's face co-championship leader He's won a championship in Grand Am in a Mazda RX-8. He's trying to win one in a Ferrari 458. We'll be back.
Chevrolet Camaro is winning races in the Grand American Rolex Sports Car Series, and it's fast becoming a favorite. Several of the teams and drivers in the GT category. But Camaro is also winning in dealerships across the country. The Chevrolet has produced its highest performing production Camaro of all time, the ZL1. Camaro has been tested at some of the most challenging racetracks around the world, including the Nuremberg Ring. It's racetrack capable right off the showroom floor with a 580 horsepower all aluminum 6.2 liter supercharged engine capable of sprinting from 0 to 60 in 3.9 seconds. You might think the ZL1 is all about power, but it's about so much more. The ZL1 sports magnetic ride control, four wheel independent suspension, world class braking, aerodynamic elements creating downforce as well as transmission and oil coolers. The ZL1 is the most technologically advanced Camaro ever produced, and now you can even get one in a convertible. To learn more about Camaro, you can go to Chevy.com or join the legion of Camaro fans at Facebook.com slash Chevy Camaro. And Calvin and I had the pleasure of doing a couple of laps with Brian in that car, and what a nice ride it is. And we have uh, the Chevy pace car here this weekend and of course big news Dorsey in the NASCAR Nationwide Series announcing the uh, Chevy Camaro that will compete in the 2013 Nationwide Series. Great looking car. A very good looking car. That's going to make for some really sexy looking race cars next year when they get the field set. I'm just glad Brian was driving and not you. And it wasn't raining. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be serious. Let's talk. At least he can get full throttle. <laughs> Let's talk business, and it's serious business down at Mike Shank Racing. This is not a good sight for the 60. I have to wonder if they were involved with the 73 Porsche because there was damage that wouldn't have happened from the gravel trap. There was damage to that left front rim, damage to the suspension. You can see there. What are you hearing, Brian? What I see is a very uh, disappointed Mike Shank, to say the least. Mike guys upstairs there was some, some conjecture was Oz caught up with the 73 one of the GT cars that had a problem yeah it was I, I don't even know what to say he got caught out by a 73 Porsche that we shouldn't even been near the boy we came out of that pit strategy P1 we came out of the pit time I, I don't even know what to say I, I, he's done such a great job today got us from almost a lap down to the lead literally out of that great strategy by the guys and you know I, I, not everybody should get to race in the Rolex series that's for sure Sometimes traffic works for you. Today it worked against Mike Schenker Racing and Oz Negri. Chris? No, Jonathan Bomarito and Sylvan Tremblay, fourth in the overall championship, second on the racetrack right now. And Jonathan, you guys going with a little bit different strategy today. You started Sylvan in the car now. You're going to finish up. All these cautions that we've had in this rain uh, that keeps coming back, is that going to play out what you guys weren't expecting with your strategy? Yeah, we, we definitely didn't expect the rain, but it, it really hasn't affected or hurt our strategy to do the two driver changes. I think we're still on game plan for that. Uh, the car is running great. Speed Source is doing a good job. Uh, we, you know, we're pretty quick in the wet. We're real quick when the track starts to dry. So, you know, we have another little break after a down four. Ho hopefully it stays uh, dry for the rest of the way. You know, i got to thank the guys. They're working really hard. Castro and Mott Space and Mazda for all their support. Continental Tire brought a new tire to Indianapolis specifically for this racetrack, and a lot of the GT teams did well on that tire, but I talked to some Mazda teams, and they didn't like it because of the weight of the car, but you guys made it work this morning. Yeah, I mean, we made it work. We were on the pole, um, so, you know, we, we definitely found something there, but, but it was a struggle. You know, with the lighter cars, it's a little bit harder to load the tire, but it lives a long time, and uh, it favors us on a long run, hopefully. Well, this team, they've got one win this year way back in the springtime. They're hoping to get one here this July at the Brickyard. They're running good right now. Currently second, Jordan Taylor holds the lead as he returns to the auto house machine. With Bill Lester this weekend, the guy that he co-drove with last year to a very close runner-up finish in the championships. Here we see Sylvain. A moment ago, uh, we saw him actually loosen his belts, trying to clear the fogging on the inside of that windshield. So he's having some visibility issues. That may be a factor here if we get back to green hour and 51 minutes to go here at the brickyard and we're ready to go back to racing and if your team owner peter barron you'd be feeling pretty good about your cars being one two angelelli third pruitt fourth dixon fifth donahue sixth barbosa seventh gurney eighth and paul tracy ninth so alex popov has decided to come back to pit road must be an issue. It might be a visibility issue yeah. because there's no reason for him to be hitting pit lane right now if we're heading back to green. And after he's just been serviced some three laps ago. Yeah. The 60 is still stationary on pit road. We're ready, ready to go racing. 
This is going to be a tough task for these guys. And no silly mistakes here can be afforded. Two of the best in the business right now going to go battling for the lead here right now. Ryan Dial against Max Angelelli side by side down into the break zone. Scott Pruitt right behind oh, yeah. him alongside his teammate for the day, Scott Dixon. Well, and if you're anything but front row, you just don't have any option about seeing. Did you see those guys hit those puddles in the submarine? Pruitt certainly did, and Dixon was on the better line. He went around the outside. Meanwhile, further back, the 43 is battling out here, the GT traffic. They're going hard at it, the 66 TRG machine. That is Jörg Bergmeister, who's won twice here before in Porsche Super Cup. He knows which direction this track goes, and Bergmeister goes right around the outside. I'll tell you what, through this infield, these... GT cars, their suspension is a little bit softer. Look at that. He's got more grip than the DPs. The downforce of the DPs doesn't have an effect here right now. Bergmeister is hooked up and flying by everyone. Well, we talk about the Porsche having the engine over the rear wheels and that having a distinct advantage when it gets to rain. You just saw it right there. Bergmeister knows how to drive one of those cars. He's about to take it into the lead of the race because he's only got one car left to pass. That's the 70 or rather the 88. So we'll see what Bergmeister can do as the scramble and the spray. This is wild. With the Daytona prototypes, with the heavy downforce, you have to run a very stiff platform to control that with the GT cars. They kind of, a little bit softer, they wallow around a little bit more, Dorsey, and in these conditions, that gives you grip. Yeah, no doubt. The softer you can make the car, the more it rolls, the more it rolls, the harder it pushes the tire through the water and down into the grip. Look at this. Look at Dane Cameron. I think he may have just taken the lead in GT. He just got around the 88. 99 radioing in. We understand visibility problems are massive. This lap. Hit this lap. Hit this lap. That's a communication. Ooh, that was oh. close. Look at that. The 90 car heads for pit lane. Nearly got cleared by two GT machines. Great work by the 43 and the 44. Lally and Cameron. That was tight. Gurney is in. Whew. None of those guys obviously knew that that was going to happen. Look at this, where the cars head. They're out there, right in the middle of all that. That was wild. So, good work there by the 44 of Andy Lally to avoid contact. Jordan Taylor, he's fighting it out with Andrew Davis in the 59 machine. 43 of Dane Cameron, good going. In a good position in the North American Endurance Championship as well. Brian. Alex Gurney trying to do what a Gurney has never done, and that is find victory lane as a driver. We talked about that earlier, but you've got to be able to see to get there. He's on the radio under that full course caution saying, I have serious visibility issues, and now there's an official trying to hold him in pit lane for some reason. Watch this. Watch how close this. Gurney is slowing down. Watch Cameron there. Narrowly miss him. Then Gurney tries to head for pit lane. Lally has to dive to the pit road to avoid him. That was very close for a big one. One thing you can't do, you cannot drive around here without visibility, and that's a bad sight right there. That's sad. That is such a heartbreaker for Mike Shank and the boys. The Rolex 24 winners are done, and their hopes of winning another $100,000 in the North American Endurance Championship are dashed. Let's bring you up to speed with a race recap because we've had a little bit of everything today, including the way the race started. We've had three full course cautions. We've had rain, we've had sun, we've had wet and dry conditions. This was at the start of the race. Antonio Garcia going around Max Angelelli. It was contact there with both the 10 and the 01 and damage sustained to the 90, Spirit of Daytona Corvette. Yeah, Garcia going for it on the opening lap there. Just got clipped by Angelelli enough to turn him around. A little bit of carnage, but there was another problem with that 90 car that put them behind the wall for a bit. Then there's a great battle for the lead here between Fogarty and Rojas. What a move down in turn one. That was all nice and clean. And you can thank the 99 for that. First round of stops, and Gaines Co. actually did a nice job. They went from wets to dries. There was a little hiccup at the Ganassi squad on the 01. It was enough to send the Red Dragon back out in front. And look at this for a move, the move of the race. Yeah, the 99 car got bought a little bit there by GT traffic, and Rojas just was through in a flash, just dynamite stuff. And then the rain came, and GT leader Robin Liddell slapped the pit wall so hard. Look at the left rear. Severe damage and severe damage to his North American Endurance Championship hopes and his Rolex Series hopes. So we bring you back to action and the Continental Tire Race Recap.
Look at that. We've had nine lead changes in this one. We've had a little bit of everything, as I mentioned. Ryan Dial is at the top at the moment. And chasing him down hard is Max Angelelli. They've just put a lap on the 99 Red Dragon of Alex Gurney, who came in. Visibility problems there. Drama was almost involved in a huge accident. And he's got his hands full getting up to speed. Well, they'll be bitterly disappointed because the car has been really fast here today, Dorsey. But when you can't see, you can't see. You just can't continue to drive a race car when you can't see nothing in front of you. And that was the condition that Gurney was in. And usually when you come in and your pit guy cleans the inside, well, that doesn't fix the problem, does it? It just masks it. During that race recap, we showed you a terrific pass coming through the final turn, turn 13, which is turn one on the speedway. It was executed by Memo Rojas, the co-championship leader. Here he is, he's with Brian. Memo Rojas, some spectacular racing out there in the early goings here at the Brickyard. You've driven in different types of weather conditions here. What's it like right now out there for Scott Pruitt? Well, it's certainly really difficult. The track is really slippery on the infield as opposed to the banking. So we're having to deal with uh, different uh, track surfaces. Uh, you know, you just need to be on top of the wheel and uh, try to push the car to the limit. A little bit of everything out there in your stint. You led the race, you had a spin, you went back and forth. Traffic right now, we've also seen that come into play. How difficult is that for the Daytona prototype driver? I mean, that's a problem because you cannot really give away much under traffic because otherwise you get... you get uh, people running behind you uh, getting runs on you on the long straightaway, so... You need to be a little bit aggressive on traffic. Uh, unfortunately, that cost me a spin, but um, we have a good car and, uh, you know, we still have way to go. So luckily we have a good race. Best of luck, the, zero, the five, we understand, has had a problem and we're full course caution. Yes, Brian, it's the third full course caution or fourth if you count the way that the race started under yellow. This is David Donahue in the five going nowhere. Stuck in the gravel trap again and you know, the gravel trap does what it's supposed to. It stops the car from further damage, but it does necessitate a full course caution to pull him off with that wrecker. Yeah, there's just no margin. And I mean, unfortunately, I think these gravel traps are more designed for the bike guys than, uh, than the cars here when they run in this configuration. So it's just creating difficulties here to keep the, car, the race under green flag conditions. And those gravel traps are pretty deep in terms of they just sink to the axles as we see. The man we're all looking forward to seeing back in a Rolex car here this afternoon, JPM getting kitted up. Montoya adds to his already amazing career of vehicles he has raced at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He takes another step in just a few moments. Need to tell you about one of the most enjoyable shows on the network. It's NASCAR Race Day, fueled by Sunoco, Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, they're going to have the latest on the AJ Armendinger suspension and what's next for Penske. Jimmy Johnson, Joey Logano, Ryan Newman, all of you on the show live. Join JR and the gang. There's JPM, Juan Pablo Montoya. We're under caution, so there's no crazy rush as Scott Dixon climbs from the car. Well done. The Kiwi rock solid, as always. And Montoya... Well, he just electrifies this field when we see him every year at the Rolex 24. Sometimes he infuriates the field, too, <laughs> when he pushes and shoves them out of the way. The good news is that they're doing this driver change under yellow because this is not how they rehearsed it. What are you seeing, Chris? Well, the team obviously getting a chance to take a little bit more time with this driver change, but not changing the tires down here. You guys have a little bit better vantage point than I do than what the rest of the racetrack looks like, but one thing we have seen today is this track dries out pretty quick, so they're going to stay with wet tires on the O2 car, get Juan out there, and, and I'd have to say at this point in time, it looks like Jamie Mack is probably not going to drive today. Uh, they were going to use him, use that three-driver strategy. I'm assuming at this point in time, we'll probably not see Jamie McMurray behind the wheel, the uh, 2010 Brickyard 400 winner and uh, I think the team just calling an audible there because he doesn't have wet weather experience and that's that's a smart play I mean when you don't have a lot of wet weather experience you do not want to go out in these conditions there is Dixon and McMurray just talking about that stint and conditions etc let's show you some of the memorable moments for Juan Pablo Montoya winning the Indy 500 in 2000 just incredible and then when he drove the bmw powered williams in formula one he never finished on the podium here but he did get a best result of fourth and he was just electrifying he put on some uh, terrific moves and then of course he almost won the brickyard 400 on debut in 2007 
This guy gets it done. Yeah, he was dynamite around this place in the NASCAR and uh, came so close to winning. He got a penalty, I'm not sure if that was yet that year or another year when he ran well. Was dominating and uh, pit lane speed infraction cost him the certain victory. So again, the only driver in history to compete at the Brickyard in Formula One, in IndyCar, in NASCAR, and now Grand Am Rolex sports cars. What a career JPM has had. Chris? Yeah, it was Scott Dixon who just handed over to Juan Pablo. And Scott, you were called in here at the last minute. You didn't get to take, partake in the entire test or when the O2 car was here testing. So you only got a handful of laps, but did a great job here. Yeah, it was fun. You know, uh, it's been a while since I've been in a race where it, where it uh, starts starts wet, dries up, goes wet again. Um, the car was really good when we went to the slicks the first time. We really started to close in on that lead. And, uh, you know, we had a bit of a bobble, I think, in the pits. We changed our strategy a little bit. But... I just wanted to keep it on track. It's not my deal. I was just trying to help out. And, uh, you know, hopefully Juan and Jamie can have a great day today in the Chevron, uh, Chevron car. I keep asking the team manager, Mike Hall, if Jamie Max is going to get behind the wheel. He doesn't seem to give me a real good response there. You think Jamie Max is going to get in, or is uh, at this point in time it just going to be a two driver? I don't know. I hope he does. Um, you know, I hope he gets in. He was going to start the race, as we had talked about before, but uh, you know, it was definitely pretty tricky conditions. And, and it seems on the on the infield of this track here, it really holds water. It's uh, a lot of standing water, and that's why I think you see a lot of people spinning. But uh, yeah, I hope he gets in here shortly. With all that water on the infield, did you give Juan any advice before he got out there? Um, you know, the track's constantly changing. You know, there's a few big puddles that I think he, you, know, you need to be careful of. And, yeah, areas I think where you can damage the car and others where you just might run off but uh, he's been around long enough he's, he's done a lot and seen a lot so he'll definitely know what to do. Well Scott Dixon only four laps prior to the green flag coming down today but boy he did a great job in the O2. Yep we used the phrase before plug and play for Dixie really adapts very well to these Daytona prototypes. Let's check in with Brian Till. Brian? They left the warm rain tires on the car, so he'll have warm rain tires when he heads back out. The only problem with that may be the sun's beginning to come back out. So these changing weather conditions have made it very difficult today, not only for the drivers, but for the crew members, the engineers, the strategists to make the right call. But I'm already seeing pit lane starting to dry. It wouldn't surprise me if in the next 10, 15 minutes without any more rain, we see cars back in to get slicks. We're fast approaching the halfway mark. One hour, 32 minutes to go in this three-hour race. These guys are having a good day. Uh, Dian van Malka qualified the car up in the top five, which is really an impressive run, which this team is continuing to develop. Dorsey, and it's showing signs of uh, the speed we anticipated from the car from Audi. Uh, they really had to make a lot of changes to make it fit the Grand Am specification at the beginning of the year and I think it really hurt a lot of the aero on the car so consequently they're having to band-aid things a little bit but right now showing a better form. I think they're kind of working it way back into uh, a good car again it, it was a little bit too far gone and step by step they're uh, they're getting it up to speed it's a cool looking car it certainly belongs in the series. Word from race control we are going green this time by so that's good news pleased to hear but do think about the field and these conditions it's going to be crazy it's going to be a scramble okay so Dial and Angelelli again will bring them back to the green this is the same pair that were at the lead on the last restart Pruitt's behind them on Montoya now in fifth spot having made the pit stop with the O2 Dixie get now Barbosa don't forget him he's now in fourth and when you think about the North American Endurance Championship the leaders in DP our Action Express Racing, they're running fourth with Joao Barbosa. Keep your eye on the nine. Ready to go. Gurney's a lap down. He wants to get back. If he's got visibility and he's got a strong car, he's going to push hard to get back on that lead lap. Yeah, just Ready. go for it. Ready. Green, green, green. Green, green, green is the call. Watch that red car. Can that Gainsco Corvette do anything? Look at Pruitt coming from behind in the 01. And on the inside goes Angelelli. This is good stuff, pushing his way through no, past Ryan Dial. Dial doesn't want to give it up. Angelelli's got the inside no, line there, it. makes good it job. stick. Dial's going to try and come back at him. You want to be out front, you want that visibility, Dorsey. That is a big advantage. Dial's not going to let him go. That's the huge advantage to have the visibility gives you, you know, superiority over anything behind you. And this infield doesn't drive. This infield track is not diamond cut like out on the banking. So, I mean, this is very slippery stuff. This is kind of the view that Paul Tracy has in the M&M's Doran Delara, the 77. He's trying to get by 
Alex Gurney. Look at this up front. Look at D. Allen Angelelli scrambling for grip there. We heard Paul Tracy on the radio during the caution saying, car is really squirming around even on the straightaways feels too stiff in the back kevin Doran said just hang in there the car should be okay look at montoya you see all that twitching around that's what's really hard on those half shafts on those drive shafts when that car starts snapping around like that's the back end starting to spin up and then one side of the car catching and the other side not particularly in when that patchy condition doors so you suddenly get wheel spin and then it bites that's what hurts look at this battle for the lead great stuff Remember, car number eight here is vying not only for the North American Endurance Championship, they're second in the overall Rolex series, chasing the 01. There's so much on the line here at the Brickyard today. And for the car up front, Wayne Taylor's Starport machine. Well, Simon Hodgson, team manager, said, we've had so much bad luck lately. <laughs> we are so far out of the championship. We don't care. We're simply going for race wins from here on out. That looks like Max has got the handle on the straightaway, no doubt about that. Opened up a lot on Ryan DL. We're hearing rumors that Starworks are even considering switching Here. to Corvette so bodywork before the end of the year. They just feel on certain tracks there's too much Clear. of it. Oh, this is going to be tight. Sebastian Bourdais trying to go on the inside of the 90 Spirit of Daytona machine of Richard Westbrook. Yeah, there's been some talks between the Starworks group and maybe switching to Corvette. Here we see Bourdais slide it down to the inside. Remember, Westbrook's many laps down with that fix to the rear suspension. And Bourdais is able to execute it. Completes that pass in car number two. His second consecutive race in the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. Just really heads up. Now Westbrook looks to the outside. Bourdais just saying, go away. I just want to clear this traffic and get after Pruitt. Oh, that's good. He Look made at that. a good run right there up the inside. Got both cars. Well, they get the hammer down now on the inside. Chris, tell us more about the Frenchman. Well, you know, guys, typically we see Lucas Ford in that car, and I talked to Peter Beard about that this week, and he said because Lucas wasn't able to come to the test and because Bourdais did such a great job in that car, they decided to go that direction, and, uh, and, and I just checked in with the team, and I ran into Alex Tagliani down here, and he said he's going to actually be behind the wheel of that car when we get to Montreal. So uh, we're going to see another driver in that car. I don't know if we're going to see Lucas Lohr back behind the wheel, but at least at Montreal, we're going to see Alex Tagliani not only running the Rolex Series, but he's also going to do the Nationwide Series that weekend. Well, uh, you may have seen, while Bordet was trying to get through some lap traffic, the 01 of Scott Pruitt go off. That means car number two, Bordet, is now in third overall. Wow, that is huge. That is huge. Very rarely do you see Scott Pruitt make a mistake, but these conditions, Dorsey, so easy. And we see when that back. Oh, the 51 was having a great day. It's got beach now. And that's full course caution. We'll stack everything back up again. I'm surprised to hear that news about Tagliani in the two because Bordet is available that weekend with the IndyCar schedule. So uh, Peter Barron, he likes to keep switching up the driver rotation there. A little bit more fan support when we go north of the border. <laughs> but you got, you're in the battle for a championship yeah. too. The two are not yeah. like vying right for the lead, but they're certainly still in the hunt. And you would think that the consistency of having someone like Bourdais in three races in a row would be big. So fourth full course caution of the race for Dion von Moltke in the Audi R8. Let's show you what happened here to Scott Pruitt. We were. Mentioning Sebastian Bourdais, we were watching him battling out, and Pruitt just overshot this turn. Watch this. Just gets in too deep, and you see right here, he doesn't try to make the turn. He knows he's in trouble, keeps the wheel straight, gets the car checked out, but now he's got to go through that grass to regain. That's a uncharacteristic like mistake. Oh, oh that, that was big con. That was worse than we thought. But Moltke drove up over the top. Clip by one of the Salem's cars. The Salem's car. So we seem to get going, and then we seem to be arrested again, don't we? It's a real stop-start affair. That's Wayne Taylor. His team is local, and they're looking for victory. Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is brought to you by Continental Tire. Innovative technology, driving confidence. And by Chevrolet and their award-winning cars, trucks, and crossovers. While we're under caution, I'd like to tell you about NASCAR Victory Lane, driven by Good Sam Roadside Assistance. It's Sunday, and the rule always is immediately following the race. Comprehensive post-race coverage, the Brickyard 400. The reason why we're still under caution is because of this. The stranded 
Audi R8 of Dion von Moltke and severe damage on the rear left. While we clean this up, we'll squeeze in another break so we can show you more green flag racing. Stick around. The magnitude of coming here to partake in an event is huge. The history of other companies coming here and failed is, is advantageous for us because it really gives you a wake-up call on, on how serious this place is. And the challenge is the surface. Uh, the infill surface is very smooth, very tight aggregate. The oval part is diamond cut. And it's a very uh, aggressive surface, so it's totally like the opposite end of the spectrum from the infield. Making a compound that works on both surfaces is certainly a challenge, and uh, we think we've answered the challenge. Given the history of this for a tire company, well, you, you know you're going to be under the spotlight when you come here. You're, you're pretty much to, to, driven to perform on that basis. It's the second year for Continental Tire to be the official tire supplier of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. Fascinating company. Only 27% of the revenue of that company comes from rubber products. They have a very diversified company structure, heavily involved in automotive electronics. And we're lucky to have Continental Tire as the official tire supplier. Reminding you of the Conti Series, the Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge Series coming your way. We had the race earlier today. You can see it coming up soon on speed now while we're away there's a driver change that might take you by surprise scott pruitt had only done a very brief stint in the 01 and they called memo rojas to come back out of the car the master stepped from the car i wonder if there's a problem yeah you'd have to wonder because typically scott's been the finisher for years and uh, always gets the dark job done he will openly admit he doesn't like the rain conditions, but I wouldn't say they'd want to jump out of the car. He's certainly up for the challenge, was running strong in the third spot, running similar lap times to the leaders. So I wonder if something is amiss down there. Well, we can find out. Tim Keane, the team manager, is standing by with Brian Till. Lights are out on the pace cars. What Tim Keane says, hold on. He's got to talk to Memo. Try to get to the problem, bottom of the problem. There's a problem within the cockpit. Something has come loose that they thought they might have to pit and reattach, but they've decided to keep Mimo out on the racetrack. And meanwhile, once we go back to green, we'll find out why Scott Pruitt has gotten out. Well, Scott stands there with his helmet still, still on. Still geared up, like yeah. He wants to go again, so. Bathroom break goes. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty desperate. That's what it is. I've never seen him step out of the car before. That'd be pretty bad. Yeah. All right, let's get ready to go. Look at Paul Tracy in the yellow car, third in line. He's a lap down. He's trying to get his lap back if he can get by these two. But these two are some of the toughest in the business. Max Angelelli and Ryan Dial. You ride with Paul Tracy coming to green. I think Ryan Dial. Good like that start. Pass. Good start by Angelelli there. He controlled that beautifully. He has driven, driven a great race here today. Really been smart. Got involved a little bit on the opening lap with Garcia, but other than that, brilliant performance. Rojas down the inside. Look at the blue and white car. The BMW powered Riley scoots through up the inside. He's getting past some traffic, and that was nicely done. That was a great restart because he was behind Montoya. And look at Montoya. He's three cars back, so that shows what a great restart it was by Rojas. Yeah, yeah Rojas really alive in this race in the rain. I mean, very, very aggressive and making it work. We've seen it this year. Remember that opening stint at New Jersey when he got turned around and drilled back to take the lead of the race? When he's on, he can be on fire. Young guy who started in single-seater racing, had aspirations of racing here one day. Went to Europe in single-seaters, didn't work out, came back and resurrected his career at a young age in sports cars. And now he's a multi-time Grand Am Rolex sports car Daytona prototype champion. And we've got a new leader in GT. It's Billy Johnson for Turner Motorsport. He's going door-to-door -door with Dane Cameron. This is for the lead of the class. This is the younger generation. Oh. Look at that. Billy Johnson really squeezing him. Dane will not like that. He's down on the inside as they get to that break zone. But look at that Camaro coming across the bow. That's going to get tight. It gets the bigger radius because these two guys are messing each other up so bad. That's Ronnie Bremer. And Ronnie is a little further back. He's not on the lead lap. That's not for position. The fight is between the 43 Mazda and the 94 BMW. Johnson tried to sneak up the inside into the next right-hander. Turner celebrating their 250th start here in this race in Grand Am competition. What a celebration it would be if they could stand on the top step of the podium here at Indy. Look at that Mazda sneak away. Hey, speaking about Turner, speaking about BMW, let's hear from Billy Orblin. Yeah, for this team, they've been performing well the past six weeks. They've got a win, they've got two second places, and you guys quietly up at the front right now, but you got a good battle up there. Billy, this team really hitting on all cylinders lately. Well, I 
I can't hear a word you're saying, but uh, he's, he's, we're all still on wets. He's hanging in there. We've carefully worked our way to the front. We're in this endurance championship, so if we win it, we can do well. We're going to fight it out at the end. Full speed. Go to turnmoresport.com. Keep this train a-rolling. Buy some parts. Yeah, and sitting next to Billy, like you said, Calvin, 250th race for Will Turner's team with BMW. The only BMW team that's had more starts for BMW is Schnitzer with 400. Brian? I'm down here at Ganassi Racing, Scott Pruitt just took his helmet off. And, Scott, we were a little surprised to see you out of the car. Everything okay? Everything's good. Memo was just rocking in the rain. And with these changing conditions, I just wasn't running as quick as he was. We're all about winning the championship and whatever we can do. So um, just not being too proud enough to see that Memo is doing just a terrific job with these conditions and see if we can uh, go out there and pick up some more positions. Also heard something on the scanner about he potentially pitting for something that was loose in the cockpit that needed to be reattached. Do you did you know anything about that? <laughs> yeah, we were fighting some uh, radio stuff, so that was a big thing. We were back and forth. We couldn't hear Memo. We didn't know if it got cooked up or not. So, uh, you know, Memo's doing a great job, man. He's rocking out there. Best of luck, and that shows what a champion Scott Pruitt is. He's willing to step out of the car in order to make sure that the faster driver stays in. I'll tell you what, that's what I like about Timmy Keene. He will make those hard race calls. They have so much admiration and believe in Scott Pruitt. But on the day, if he's not getting it done and Mamo is, you know what? You're getting out. Yeah, Scott didn't make that call. Timmy Keene made that call. Scott abided by that call. And he doesn't like running rain. I mean, I, I, I can totally agree with that because I don't like running rain. I did good when I did it, but it was because I hated it so much, I think. Well, what a day for this young man, for Memo Ramassier. He's won several Rolex Series championships, but for him to be teamed with a driver like Juan Pablo Montoya and pass him on track and then drive away, and we've got a new race leader, Ryan Dial, is at the top in that Starworks Ford Riley. Wow. I knew he didn't want to be passed for long. I mean, he was right at the end before we got that last caution. He was trying to get his way back around. Now it's happened. Well, let's see if Rojas can eat in to the margin. It's between he, Dial, Angelelli, and Bourdain. He's going to get up there and vie for the podium. Bordet runs wide. Angelelli, and I should say Angelelli, continues to take that line, scooting through there. He's been doing that all race long. Starworks team right now, really the 10 cars not in the hunt for this North American Endurance Championship. Right now, Starworks have two bullets in their gun. And we're talking about a remarkable season. They finished second at the Rolex 24. They then won on their World Endurance Championship debut at Sebring. They won at Lamar. What would it be like if they could clinch that North American Endurance Championship and possibly win here today? What a season there are. Remember, folks, $100,000 up for grabs for the team that wins Daytona prototypes for the North American Endurance Championship. $50,000 on the line for the GT team winners. And we're hearing reports that the 40. Visit Florida.com, Dempsey Racing Master. There it is, slowly being pushed back behind the wall. Our third final is for the two car. They have 11 laps more fuel on board than both the 10 and the 8. Goes Ford Ford goes down to the inside and takes second away. The Starworks Rileys are hooked up in these conditions. Angelelli didn't even fight that. He left plenty of room for Sebastian Bourdais. And the 99 is behind the wall. It's not good either. Headed way behind the wall. What a disappointing year for that team. They've shown so much pace but can't catch a break. Two of the enormously successful teams back done. 99 behind the wall. And then, of course, we saw the 60 Mike Shank, the Rolex 24 winners. Here's the 02 in. Is he slicks? That's correct, so. Calvin. Going over to the slicks on the 02 car. Early on, we saw Scott Dixon being one of the first cars to get, go to the slicks. Now Juan Pablo Montoya, one of the first prototypes of the slicks. Now we'll watch his time, Calvin, and see what kind of time he can make up. And this should be exciting. This boy's got a bit of car control, yeah. doesn't he? <laughs> We're about to find out. <laughs> Good scraps going on all the way down through the GT field to update you. Dane Cameron has solidified his position at the top. He's got about one and a half seconds over Billy Johnson in that 94 Turner Motorsport BMW. The 88 of Jordan Taylor, then the 69 of Jeff Siegel, the 70 Speed Source Mazda, the 59 Brumos Porsche, and then this car here, the 44 of Andy Lally, is forcing his way through. And that was for position. That there was just for position over York Bergmeister. <laughs> Lally over Bergmeister. Yeah, he pitted just four laps ago. He did have the lead of this race until that pit stop. So the Magnus Racing Boys trying to turn their season around. Started off the year well with a big win, of course, at Daytona. Since that time, hasn't been easy. We hear a report that Paul Tracy has spun the Doran Delara and Angelelli is in. We're going to see a driver change here too. Ricky Taylor standing by. Four, three. Well, 
Oh, and Ricky Taylor finally getting his chance behind the wheel, but then caught. And Ricky Taylor really in a pressure cooker. This team has had a very rough eight weeks. They're no longer really in this season championship. They're not in the North American Endurance Championship. They're so far back. But talk about bragging rights. They still want to win the inaugural Brickyard Grand Prix. Great stop going over to Slick. No other changes on the car. Ricky getting his chance out there. A lot of pressure on that young man. It has not been a good run for the 10 team. They need to turn it around now. One hour, nine minutes remaining here at the Brickyard. As the 22-year-old Ricky Taylor straps himself in, trying to drive to victory lane. Fox Saturday Baseball returns this week when the Red Sox head to the Bronx to take on the AL East leading Yankees in a showdown between bitter division rivals or the Dodgers and the NL West leading Giants renew their rivalry in San Francisco. Fox Saturday Baseball telecast presented by Budweiser returns this week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, 12.30 Pacific. But as always, check your local listings for game and start time in your local area. We welcome you back to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Lee Diffie along with Calvin Fish, Dorsey Schrader, Brian Till and Chris Neville. We're under caution again for the fifth time in this race and it's due to a spin by David Donahue in the number five Action Express car and he is stuck and needs help. There is the situation right there over in turn seven. There was a uh, confrontation between the five and the 90. Let's check it out. Richard Westbrook is in the blue number 90. Donahue on the inside in the five. And it just got wrong for David. I mean, Westy gave him some room, really. There's good racing yeah. room there, and uh, David just touched him and got turned around and then high-sided here on the curb. So just unfortunate. Not been a good day for the five machine. However, it has been a very good day for Starworks. Let's hear from the team principal. Here's Peter Barron with Chris. Yeah, great, great year so far for Peter Barron. Very consistent on the eight car. You guys are in a great position with this championship. But we got about 65 minutes left here to go. Can you guys stretch this to the end? There's been a lot of yellows, and with the rain and everything, it's helping us for sure. You know, I, I think everybody is uh, you know, a couple more yellows. We can get there. You know, who knows what's going to happen? Lots of rumors about you guys potentially changing from a Ford over to a Corvette before the year is over. With where you are in the championship, is that going to be a smart move? No, I mean, sure, there's, there's rumors that racing's awesome because it's full of it. You know, the, <laughs> a, a friend, uh, Enzo and I were having lunch with uh, Dave Mirage from Champion Porsche Audi, and uh, he was the team owner that won with Champion at Le Mans and all that, and he's had a lot of success. And the thing he said to us is within racing, sometimes you get a window. And you never know when you're going to get a window again. And if you're in the window, do whatever you can to make sure that you stay in that window. And, you know, right now, obviously, we like our Ford and everything. But if, you know, we, we know we're down downforce. And the series is working hard to get that, you know, all sorted. The last two races of the year are for sure downforce tracks with Laguna and Lime Rock. And, you know, we got to stay in the window, but we haven't done anything. Uh, Peter Brader might be looking at that overall championship, but today he'd like to grab that North American Endurance Championship and that $100,000 check. Well, you can see with the drivers that he employs when he's bringing in these guest drivers, he goes for the best in the business, and I understand the reasoning there. They feel they're going to go to certain racetracks where this Riley chassis is not able to generate enough downforce. Dorsey, they're looking at every way to win this championship. And he's not the first team owner to do such a thing either, for that matter. You look at what your strong suits are, and you understand you've got a couple races coming up that you're not going to be good at. Well, if you have the ability to make a move, you make that move. We mentioned this right at the top of the broadcast, but a quick reminder on what is ahead tonight on speed when we're finished here from the Brickyard. Join Adam Alexander in the Speed Center at 7.30 Eastern. And then trackside here from Indy. That's at 8 right after Speed Center. And then more live racing from Indianapolis from Lucas Oil Raceway, the ARCA Series here on speed. Kevin Swindell had that flag-to-flag -flag victory last week. Can he do it again here in Indy? You'll find out what a great night ahead here on speed. We'll be back to the Brickyard just a moment. It's nice to see the sunshine. Also, although it's through a somewhat of a fogged lens there on <laughs> Paul Tracy's M&M's Doran Delara. But the sun is shining, probably the strongest that we've seen in the last couple of hours. We've got less than one hour left to run in this three-hour event, the inaugural race for the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. 
to this point, it hasn't been the race we'd hoped for. It's been a little bit too start-stoppy for my liking. Too many cautions. Let's get a good passage of racing going here to the end. And while we're in that break, there were a sequence of stops. Chris Neville, update us if you would, mate. Yeah, Lee, one of the cars that came in the 02 car, Juan Pablo Montoya, he had to come in because he had a lot of grass um, in the radiator. He took that car off the racetrack. That grill was completely full of grass. Also, they topped up that car. I just asked team manager Mike Hall if they can make it to the end. He said it's going to be a stretch, but they're going to do the best they can. Yeah, I think these guys, if we see green, dry conditions, they're about 10 minutes shy. Remember, the Fords don't get as good a mileage as the Chevys or the BMW. So that eight car and the two car, that will be a factor here. We see a lot of green flag running. That's Paul Dallalana pumping himself up. Billy Johnson's job is done. In comes in, in the 94. And I take that back. That's Billy Orblin. It is. It's a bit hard to tell from that overhead view. Billy is now climbing aboard. So all three drivers have had a go. Chris? Yeah, Billy Arbelin finally getting his chance behind the wheel of that BMW M3. That car running in second place when it came into the ring. Came into pit lane here, so they should be good to go now. Will Turner thought they could make it at this point in time, putting slicks on that car, Arbelin, and also making a wicker change at the back end of the 94. Brian? No changes down at Team Salem, the 43, other than Dane Cameron out. Wayne Ackerman, they will pull his hair off, off the windshield. They should be good to go on fuel. Wayne out in front of the 59, just. Wow, that was tight. Oh, oh. Still tight. There's a little bit of bashing there on pit lane. Yeah, I think they've got their pit lane speed limit set a little bit higher on the 59, <laughs> the 43. It was <laughs> be 45 miles an hour, but where the team set them, they're basically running on that electronically. Wouldn't that be something if the 59 Brumos Porsche could get to victory lane? Such a storied team and organization at this famed racetrack. Woo! As we ride aboard with the only Ferrari in this race. You want to flash back? Flash back 60 years ago. Because that's when Alberto Ascari entered the 52 Indy 500. He finished 31st because he actually only did 40 laps. He had a wheel problem. And it's, to this date, the only Ferrari to have ever competed in the 500. But that would have been a handful in the rain. And we see the GT point standings, Dorsey. Uh, what a great year for Ferrari. Introduced that car this year, and it has been absolutely on fire. What a great performance by the AIM team, the FXDD group. Emil and Jeff again looking strong here today for another podium finish at least. See, uh, this around. has got to be strategy for fuel. Uh, that's the only thing I can think is that they don't think they can do it, but surprised they're giving up track position under green. Ready to go green. It's Ryan Dial, Memo Rojas. If you've seen some of the moves that Rojas has put on, you might green, like his green, chances green. down here into turn one. Green flag flies at the brickyard. Watch that Ganassi BMW, the Telmex machine. Dial goes to the inside aggressively and holds that line firm. Rojas flicks to the outside. It's going to be a little bit drier there. Remember, they put their faith in Memo getting the job done in these tricky conditions. Boy, Memo definitely wanted that turn one. That's where he's been making his moves. Wasn't well, going to happen with the car in front of him, though. Let's not forget about the car. Fourth in line, car number nine. Gas and go for the 10. The Starport machine is released for Wayne Taylor Racing. Don't forget about oh, the look at this. Move. Wow, this is Bordet on Rojas. What amazing move. Rojas yes. comes back at him. He's locked up. He's running wide. Can he keep it together? No, he's off the oh, racetrack. The... the championship leader. Can he keep it going through that gravel trap? Come, Come on, on, baby. Dig, dig. Keep going. He gets it. He got it through. No caution. That was some awesome racing right there, but you got to think about the big picture to the too, Mamo. Oh, look at this. Let's go, and he's fortunate that he, it was gravel and not yeah, grass yes, in that yes. air intake in the grill. He's clear. He should not need to come back in. We're here, and it was a splash of fuel for the number 10 car. What a bold call, strategy-wise, by Simon Hodgson and his team. Let's look at this. Borde slices it to the inside. Watch this for racing side by side. Roy has said, no, you're not going to take it. Gets in too deep, Dorsey. Boy, I just drove it in there. We did the only thing he could. Look at him. Good car control, good brake modulation, but not enough as it goes off. But he He's got the presence of mind to floor it. Get out of that gravel trap before he gets stuck. It has been quite the day for Memo Rojas. Look at this, Bordet said, here I come, here I come. This That's is turn four. Then the little sweeper there through five. 
Rojas now to the inside, takes it in deep and just runs out of road. Oh, had it so close though. Oh, oh that this was is fun. massive, Ronnie Bremer. Ronnie oh. Bremer, so that's both Stevenson cars have been crashed heavily today. Wow, and remember, they were the lone bullet for these guys in that North American Endurance Championship. Either one of the cars can score points. Right now, it looks like neither one will. That was a big hit on the Pretty wall. Trouble here. here. This is going to be helpful for the O1 to be able Look to Look at this. In. He's got to be involved oh. in this. Yeah, he's this got This is involved. not from the spin, guys. No, no, no. This is something different altogether. We've got replays. We will show you. What a day. Remember the Stevenson team in the lead of the North American Endurance Championship in GT. Oh, right in front of him. No, no, no. This is going to be the reason for the crash. Oh, oh. man. Rojas trying to thread the needle through a hole that was not big enough. Yeah, going around the outside there, the GT cars, we said they're walking out there. They don't have the grip of the DP cars, and Bremer just needed a bit more road than Rojas was leaving him. Nothing he could do up after the contact, of course. <sighs> Big hit. So. And the irony in this is the off by Mamo put him in this position to be a bit further in the pack. Stay out right now. Stay out. Get packed up. Stay out. Get packed up. Let's show you some more. High angle. And just watch the gap. Watch how narrow it is where he's trying to put that O1. Telmex BMW Riley. Oh, boy, and then Bremer, did you see the car twitch? I mean, he was loose going in there already. Rojas has been committed throughout the course of this race, but sometimes it will reward you, other times it will oh, bite that's you. That's a big hit right there. I just bit him. This is Ronnie Bremer. He, he, he's probably going to be pretty disgusted with that because there's nothing he could do. No. He has to use as much racetrack as the GT needs. Doesn't have the downforce to just keep it and tuck it to the inside. At the point Memo moved, made that move around the outside, Ronnie got loose already. The car had opposite lock in it. He was yeah. using up the racetrack that he needed. And there's nothing he could have done. He couldn't defend against it, nor could he adjust for it. Chip Ganassi's men are standing by. How much damage is on that 01? The very talented Danish driver is all right as he heads back to the Stevenson pit and explaining to the Turner boys there what the situation was. How bad a shape is this 01 in? And if it's not good, there are massive championship implications here because the guys, the team chasing them in the Rolex Sports Car Series, leading, leading this race. This is huge. He came into this race with a three-point lead. What's the version of events for Ronnie Bremer, Chris? You got some pretty good damage behind the right front tire. Well, Ronnie Bremer just hopping over the wall, coming down pit lane. Ronnie, we saw that crash there in turn one. Did you have any idea the 01 car was to your outside? No, I mean, he's, he's passing me where you can't pass, you know. You, no cars are slower. Wait, be patient. I mean, he, he hit me on the way out. Can't do that. I mean, he's being silly, my opinion. It's just luck nobody to get hurt, you know. Obviously, lots of frustration by Ronnie Bremer. Also, this team, they were in a great spot to try and win this North American Endurance Championship in the GT category. That's not going to happen today. That is not going to happen. And for all of the decisiveness and skillful moves we've seen from Rojas today, that one was a move out of desperation. Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you what, that left rear wheel yep, that is, bent. is bent. Hopefully, there's no suspension damage, but definitely look from the rear angle of that that there was some run out. Hopefully it's just the rim and nothing more. We are going to pit now for driver change, tires, and fuel. And clean the car up the best we can. Let's just have some of our uh, bare bond duct tape. This is where the Ganassi guys are so good. Remember the Glenn when they had the right hand across and they got that changed out within a lap. Question from Rojas is, what do you want me to do, Timmy? Timmy is Tim Keane, the team manager at Chip Ganassi Racing on the sports car side of things. Another look at what Romy, Ronnie Bremer just spoke about. Yeah. Just, you can't, that, that's just being too aggressive. Yeah. I mean, there's a fine line and that's just crossing the line, I think. And Bremer didn't, I mean, he had, didn't have a chance of doing anything more than what happened. He was just along for the whole mess. If he pinched anymore, he's going to spin himself out. Yeah, he was he loose. didn't see him and he tried to, yeah, there's, there's a gap what, that wasn't there. When they assess that 01, I will be very surprised if there's not more severe damage than what we can see yeah. from the outside looking in. Uh, you know, Brian's on the spot. What do you see, mate? Well, I'm looking down the left side of the 01 as Memo Rojas climbs out. 
Crew members looking under the backside. A lot of body damage, as you would expect. When the left rear wheel goes on, it looks firm, so I don't see any loose suspension pieces on the left bond. side. We put on the front. That's what we need. Timmy saying fair bond. It's like a giant piece of heavy duty duct tape. It'll help hold the bodywork together. A lot of gravel in the front suspension. Crew looking over the rear bodywork. And I'm looking at that right rear. It was solid too when they placed it on. So no loose suspension pieces like you might expect in a impact like that. So none of the pieces broken. The question is, are they bent? They could still be solid. In fact, it didn't look like it had a lot of camber in the left rear when they came in, but that could just be something visual. So we'll have to wait and see. And really the best way to know, the only way to know is when Scott Pruitt gets out on the racetrack and see if the car tracks straight. The other question is, when those wheels hit the wall that solidly, it shoves the axle yeah. in into the transaxle. Has it done the half shaft in? That's the next thing to fail, even if it didn't hit that. I'm surprised they didn't take a closer look under the left corner there. They just changed that left rear and didn't really look at any of the suspension parts being bent, as Brian suggested would be the case. Where's the pace car? Make sure they keep them on this lab, of course, so they'll be watching and observing where the pace car is at this point. Even if the car is not completed in its repair, they have to get him back out and stay on this lead lap. Scott Pruitt behind the wheel asking the question, where is that pace car? A man who knows the Brickyard very well. He was an Indy 500 Fire Rookie out. of the Year. Look out. Look out. Several Brickyard 400s in NASCAR Sprint Cup competition. And then now he heads out. Will that car be in good shape at high speed? Pruitt's about to find out as the Stevenson boys console themselves and explain a crazy situation. Back at the Brickyard as we count it down, less than three quarters of an hour to run. In the inaugural race at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the Rolex Sports Car Series. And we're coming to an end of this caution period to go racing again with Ryan Dial out in front. Said a little while ago, don't discount car number nine. Joao Barbosa on two occasions this season, he has made an incredible pass for the lead, which eventually got him the win of the race. And most recently that was done at Watkins Glen International for the Salem six hours at the Glen. And the reason why you don't discount him is because he was integral with he and Darren Law in taking Action Express to the top of the points for the North American Endurance Championship. It's going to be a winner-take-all situation. And look at Montoya back there in third. <laughs> he wants a piece of the action as well, even though he can't win $100,000. Ready to see green, and Montoya's ready to race. He was asking in the driver's meeting, when can I initiate the pass? He said, don't <laughs> even think about it before the strike. So he's careful. He listened. But he's thinking in the right direction, right? Tell you what I like about Starworks, their split strategy. You see Bourdain, the two machine, further back in the pack. Look at this. Barbosa looks to the outside. Doesn't quite have enough grip to get to the inside for turn two. So Starworks have split their strategy. They've topped Bourdain up with fuel. Those Fords are a little bit thirstier. They should be good to go. And Montoya got a much better run through there. That allowed him to bridge that gap ever so to Barbosa. Meanwhile, Dial is escaping. He's scooting away really quickly. Tell you what, they're going to tell Montoya, go for it. Attack, attack, because they are the lone bullet in the gun. Pruitt's car is wounded, and he's further back in the pack. They need to win here today if they're going to get this North American Endurance Championship. We have news for Paul Tracy, guys. He jumped his start. The 77 is going to get a penalty. And that older generation car, that M&M's yellow Doran Delara, is on the lead lap and was legitimately fourth. That penalty is going to take him out of the mix. Here comes Bourdais. Look at this, the old champ car. <laughs> Foes there going out. I remember back in Denver on the streets of Denver where Borde and PT take each other out. There's almost 50 cuffs that day. Right now, PT has the position, but he's got to serve that penalty. And that's a shame. It's just really, we wanted this to happen. We wanted him up there. Love to see him in a current generation car because I think PT has the passion to make it work and still has the skills to take it to the front. Thank you. He obviously did not come in to serve that penalty that time around. So it's Ryan Dial, the Scotsman, leading the Portuguese driver Joao Barbosa, the Colombian one, Pablo Montoya. And then the 90 machine for Spirit of Daytona, the British driver Richard Westbrook, not on the lead lap. And how about in GT? There's a terrific scrap going on here. Magnus leads the way, the 44 car. Jonathan Bomarito's there, the 59 of Lee Keane, and the 88 of Jordan Taylor. 
Wow. This race is wide open. There's Andy Lally, last year's NASCAR Sprint Cup Rookie of the Year, out in front. Porsche run one, two right now. Brumo's team got off to the start of the season with a pair of podiums. Since that time, it's been a struggle. Can they turn things around here at Indy? And look at that black Porsche at the back of this train. That is Jorg Bergmeister, former Rolex Daytona prototype champion. He's flying. He is absolutely flying. He was a lap oh, earlier look, in this race. Right there, Jordan Taylor got into the back of 70, didn't turn it. Think about this. Bergmeister's fast laps are 130.2. Lally's is a 131.8. Bergmeister is flying. Mentioned earlier in the race, he's a winner twice here in Porsche Super Cup back in 2000 and 2001. He just rings the neck out of one of these cars. He, of course, has won a Daytona prototype championship back in 2006 with Crone Racing. Just love to see him back in Rolex competition when he makes these rare appearances. Oh, look, at, look at him back there. Really working over the back of Taylor. All of these GT runners, Dorsey, are on the same strategy. They all pitted seven laps ago. I think it's still going to be tight for those guys on fuel, but this yellow will have helped. They might be able to sneak it. And there is the yellow M&M's machine. Paul Tracy coming to pit road. He will be furious with that. Let's show you a replay of that restart. And to repeat, Paul Tracy being assessed a penalty for allegedly jumping the restart. Boys, let's have a closer look at it. What I don't understand, I was a lap car, I was going to say, because Montoya's third. Yeah, here comes Tracy. You, you can't even initiate a pass on a lap car, which he was doing there with Westbrook. I was going to say, he certainly didn't make position. He started fourth and got into turn one in fourth. But he initiated a pass on a lap car, and yeah. you can't do that. Even a lap car, you cannot make that pass just pass start finish. Look at this fight going on here. 70, 88, 66. It's Jonathan Bomarito, Jordan Taylor, Jorg Bergmeister, and Bill Orbelin is trying to tag onto the back of that group as well. He's only about one and a half seconds behind. Yeah, he's got some pace. There you see the Ferrari, Jeff Siegel in eighth spot right now. Maybe up to seventh, he may have got around. Wayne Nonamaker looking at that shot. Last time around, Lally had a 1.3 second lead over fellow Porsche driver. Lee Keen will keep an eye on that margin. We're also going to keep an eye on this famous 66 Kevin Buckler's TRG team. Some people may be asking, where is Spencer Pampelli this weekend and why is Bergmeister in one of the Kevin Buckler's cars? This deal was done a long time ago when Spencer was still running with Steve Bertha. Steve Bertha was taking a little bit of a break from the action and they couldn't have, didn't want to turf York out of this seat that they'd committed to, so that's why he's here and Spencer is on the sidelines. Here comes that Adobe Road Porsche on the inside, Bergmeister on Taylor. Jordan really hangs tight. tough. He does. Well, it wasn't enough up there to make it totally by either, so that's all that's fair. Yeah. Think, yeah. Think Good team been, racing. We've been remiss to say welcome back to the series, Auto House. Yeah because they missed the Watkins Glen six hour. And also welcome back to the series, Bill Lester. Bill and Jordan Taylor, of course, were the combination last year who ran for the entire season. Guys, I was talking to Jordan Taylor before the race. And he said, Bill Lester really doing a great job here. The delta between the two of them, smaller than it ever was last year. So Jordan was pretty excited about their chances. He said, the problem is the front straight away. So as they come back around, watch for that Porsche against that Camaro in a straight line. See who has the advantage. Jordan Taylor thinks it certainly doesn't rest with the Camaro. Yeah, it's a big greenhouse to push down these straightaways. You can see the difference in size, sheer physical size of the race cars. But... Uh, I think Bergmeister is a little bit quicker, no disrespect to Jordan Taylor, but he's doing everything he can to keep him behind. I think Bergmeister might have something for the lead of this race if he can just make his way through this GT cars in front of him. You're not missing anything up front. Ryan Dial is still leading overall for Starworks by less than a second over Joao Barbosa. And then one Pablo Montoya is running in third to Chris Neville. Chris? Well, the Wheeling Corvette currently running in 10th right now. Boris, uh, obviously pretty cool to be out here at the Brickyard this weekend, but you guys have had a tough season. I know going in, you guys were hoping to win some races, but 7th being your best performance all year. But you guys have had some speed in that Corvette. Yeah, I mean, the Wheeling Corvette's been really, really fast at the Brickyard. It'd be a big one to win. I mean, the Brickyard is just uh, it's a race in itself. I raced two Brickyard 400s here at NASCAR, and, and all the goosebumps and the hair on your arms is just an amazing place. So for Grand Am to be here, it's pretty cool. I am. I'm hoping 
hoping it goes green the rest of the way, and I think all those guys are going to need fuel, and we don't. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we'll make it. Well, and he's hoping that everybody else is going to have to come to pit lane, but the teams that I'm checking in, we're all saying they're good to go. Yeah, I think it's going to be tight, Chris. I heard that when you said, uh, like the Turner boys and stuff said they're good, and uh, I think they're still close. Uh, based on models that we're seeing from other races, obviously this is a new racetrack, and everyone's learning not a lot of track time to really get that data down, but they're certainly going to be stretching it a little bit. We should give a shout out to, speaking of the 31, Whelan Corvette, the Marsh Racing Corvette. Sonny Whelan, the man behind the name of this team, has officially retired from motorsports racing and he's focusing his endeavours on Team Fox, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, to find a cure for Parkinson's disease. Sonny, well done on your 10 years of motor racing. Where does this series go from the Brickyard? It goes to another legendary track, Watkins Glen International. That's the short course race, and it's just a two-hour sprint live at 6 p.m. on August 11. That's in two weeks' time. Then we go north of the border, the Circuit Gilles Villeneuve, Montreal, Mazda Raceway, Laguna Seca, Lime Rock Park. Some pretty cool tracks coming up. What venues we have visited this year. Just a tremendous calendar for the Rolex series. How about this? You've got two Starworks Ford Rileys up front. Car number two, Sebastian Bourdain, four-time champ car titleist, is flying. And he is going to go for the lead of this race with 32 minutes to go. Boy, Ryan Diel is not going to give this to him. He's not going to like being passed. He does give it to him. It appears so. Wow. Just looks like Bourdais' car is hooked up, took it to the outside, took it in deep on the brakes, takes the lead. Remember, he got more fuel on board, they made that later pit stop. They are in great shape, and so is Starworks. They're running one, two. One of these cars can bring it home. They're going to win that North American Endurance Championship. The nine car Barbosa got dropped to third, and I unbelieve. Oh, he's got spun. Oh, no. That is the leader of the North American Endurance Championship coming into this race. Oh, and he's in the gravel. Both Action Express Corvettes have got stuck out on track today, and we're going to see yet another yellow. This is the seventh full course caution of this race. This is going to really help the eight car, because I believe Peter Barron was telling Chris Neville during the break that he's good on fuel, but they had to be tight. This should get them well inside their window. It's also going to allow this guy, Montoya, to close up on the back of those Star Wars cars, and he'll have got the message from Chip Ganassi and Mike Carl. We need you to win this race. This will show us the nine. Oh, and it's contact with the O2 with Montoya. Oh, that makes that even worse. <laughs> Brian Till standing by at Action Express and a pretty dejected Darren Law. Yeah, we were just talking a couple of minutes ago and watching the race, and I knew that the nine had slipped back a position, but you just saw the replay there. Looked like Joao kind of mugged a little bit by uh, the 0-2 car. That's going to take uh, your hopes of a North American Endurance Championship away, I would think, Darren. Yeah, you know, I mean, this this is tough. The car is good. Action Express has done a great job. And, uh, I mean, we were not only fighting for the North American Endurance Championship, we're in the points hunt for the title chase here. Uh, it's tough when you get other guys coming in the series and, and fighting us like that. I don't know. This is a tough one. That's a real bummer because we were in the hunt for sure. They felt like they had the tires and the fuel to make it to the end, but right now they just don't have the luck. Got a good point there, Calvin, about other guys in the series that, you know, don't have vested interest in the championship and yeah. what their job might be. That's right. For the O2 team, I mean, they really have nothing to lose. They're trying to help out win this North American Endurance Championship for Chip Ganassi. But other than that, they're not in the title height. And as Darren said, he is. And they also had the lead in the North American Endurance Championship coming in. And there's a replay of Montoya getting into the side of Joao Barbosa. As I believe it, Grand Am had a quiet word with Ganassi team manager Tim Keane prior to this weekend and said, keep Montoya under control. <laughs> we have seen what he's done at the Rolex 24. He doesn't mind roughing it up and bashing a few panels and going door to door. Uh, unfortunately, it's happened. Well, the nature of this race course, we've talked about it before, Dorsey, turns four and six. You really run a wide entry there, and it does open up the door. It looks pretty initially, and then suddenly that guy's going to come down at the apex, and... Uh, Montoya just stuck his nose in there as well as coming down and turned him around. You saw Montoya at the last minute do everything he could try to do not to make contact. He threw the car sideways. Good car control, but the inevitable did happen. Speaking of good car control and speed, let's check out the progress of Sebastian Bourdais. It's the first of three passes. The first is going to be on this man here, Juan Pablo Montoya. Watch car number two. 
right up the inside. Well, this is, I think that's the same corner that Montoya just <laughs> tried to do the same move on Barbosa with a different result. And then let's move ahead to Joao Barbosa. Same corner again. And that was a little kiss also on the nine. That was a lap later. And then, of course, we know what he did for the lead. And he went around outside at turn one. Up on his Starworks teammate, Ryan Dial. One on one fight. This Ryan is impressive. Let, yeah, Ryan kind of let that happen right there once he realized. I think he was going to try to get a get back, a payback right here, but it didn't work. I mean, for Ryan, I mean, he recognizes, hey, we can, we as a team can still win this championship, and I can sk still get a bundle of points here today with the one having problems. He thought big picture then. So we're under under caution, and we'll update you on the GT positions in just a moment. But first, let's check in with Chris Neville. Well, Lee, those last couple of laps I was watching Bourdais and Dial, and it looked like Bourdais was over a second quicker for about three or four laps there catching Dial. And I asked Peter Barron if there was a problem with the eight car. And uh, once we went to caution here, he said, no, there isn't a problem. But Ryan was just conserving fuel out there. And, and that's kind of interesting because five minutes ago, I just asked Peter Barron if the eight car was good to go. And he told me it was good to go. So I don't know if there's some miscommunication going on. And Ryan was, in fact, uh, trying to conserve some fuel, which was slowing him down. Or if he just doesn't have the speed of that two car right now. Hey, Chris, when the eight car, excuse me, when the two car made that splash of fuel stop, did they take new tires or anything? Because Bourdais just looks like he's got more grip as well at this point. Yes, that was during the caution that uh, Mamo Rojas brought out with the contact with the 75 car. So we saw that car come in too. So that, that uh, the, the two car topping up much later than when we saw the eight car, the 02, and then the 10 that was just a couple laps prior. Okay, mate, thanks. The update in GT is Andy Lally leads Lee Keen. It's Porsche one and two. Jonathan Bomarito in the Mazda, but then Jorg Bergmeister is coming. We could see a clean sweep for Porsche in GT. We've still got 26 and a half minutes to go. Welcome back to Indianapolis Motor Speedway and what a race we have on our hands here, Dorsey. We've got a one-two for Starworks led by Sebastian Bourdais. He has been a man on a mission. He made that late splash for fuel. He's got a car that's really strong. He's got Ryan Dial who's looking to maybe take over the overall championship lead here tonight. And this caution not only stacks the field up, but it's bought some guys, I think, some uh, grace, if you will, on the fuel mileage situation because I, I see it as some pretty close fuel mileage numbers right now. Getting grace, I tell you what, my... <laughs> Juan Pablo yeah. Montoya dodged the bullet there. A hear win. Not going to get a penalty on JPM. So, uh, Chris, you're down there, or is it Brian? Who's down in the Ganassi camp? Well, it's me, Calvin, and Chip Ganassi's organization has won the Indy 500 five times. He's won the Brickyard 400 one time. Chip, I think your uh, driver kind of dodged the bullet there with no penalty, but how aggressive can he be with that two and eight car out front? Well, you know, Chris, it's pretty hard to be aggressive I, when. You know, the, the cars are pretty evenly matched. In fact, those cars in front of us might be a tick faster, so it's going to be awful hard for us to do. we got about 20 laps to go here, I think. And, but, you know, we'll have the, we'll get the Chevron car up there. we got the Tumex car not far behind him, so we're, uh, you never know. There's a long way to go yet. With all the success you guys have had at this racetrack, what would it mean for you to win the first sports car race? It would be pretty big, that's for sure. You know, and I mean, right now, that, that two and that eight look pretty good, so they're they're pretty stout. So uh, we'll have to wait and see them. Well, the two and the eight are pretty stout, but he's got a pretty fast bullet behind the wheel. Mike Hull sitting in there as well, keeping an eye on things. It could be a big day for the Ganassi organization, but got to get past these two flying Fords from Peter Barron's Starworks organization. Ready to roll at the brickyard. What's Bourdais got? Is he going to skip away from? Ryan Dial, or is it going to be an intra-team fight? Green, green, green. Green, green, green is the call. Let's go racing. With Ricky Taylor, they got stacked up behind JPM. He was looking to go, but he can't initiate that pass. Dial swings that wide. Here we see the battle in GT between the Porsches up front. Taylor makes the move on Montoya. Nice move. Pruitt's through as well. 
great move for position. For the years that Ricky Taylor has enjoyed watching Juan Pablo Montoya as a racer, and then Ned to go door to door with him and pull off a pass like that, well done. In GT, the fight is on like you wouldn't believe. Andy Lally's got Lee Keen, a two-time champion, all over him. Andy's a multi-time champion as well. And here's Jonathan Bomarito still trying to win his first Rolex GT championship. He's won a couple of Rolex 24s. And then you've got your Bergmeister in the 66. Here they come. Don't forget, behind them, you've got Jordan Taylor, Bill Orblin, Jeff Siegel. Well, this is going to be fantastic here in the final 21 minutes. You know, any of those Porsches mess up just the slightest bit, and that trio behind them is going to be all over them. And I'm talking about Ireland Taylor. That group right there is also potent. Been such an exciting drive from Jörg Bergmeister. The guys won just about everything there is to win in a Porsche. He won this championship for Crone Racing in a Ford-powered Riley back in 2006. Well, this is Porsche's best as far as driver lineup goes. That's them. They're all right there. Got to get past Bomarito first, then Taylor, then Orblin, as Cal mentioned. You saw that yellow and green uh, Porsche of Martin Raginger getting a little ragged and losing position. Siegel getting a run on Bill Orblin there. Coming through the frame right there, that red Ferrari. How far up the order can he get? This isn't a normal payday, boys. Remember, 50,000 bucks to those guys in GT. And remember, at the last race, which was also the last round of the North American Endurance Championship, that 44 car just about burnt to the ground. Look so, at that. This is tight racing right there. Uh, now the road they touch. Watch Jeff Siegel. He takes advantage. He gets around Jordan Taylor as Orbelin and the 88 rough it up a little bit. Yeah, Jordan got roughed up there and it pushed him out wide. He couldn't defend. And gets roughed up even more from Rui Agua in the AF Waltrip Ferrari. Look at this. He has to be careful, Jeff Siegel, right here. He's got to think big picture. Since Daytona, that 69 car has only finished off the podium once. What a remarkable run they're on right now. No positional changes in the top four. Meanwhile, overall, Bordet, Dial, Ricky Taylor, Montoya, Pruitt, top five unchanged. Keep your eye on this Ferrari BMW battle. You know Arbolin will use the body work up on that BMW. He does not care about roughing that Ferrari up if it takes it. Jeff got on the brakes really late there, but still Billy Orblin took it in about half a car length deeper. That BMW is dynamite on the brakes, and Bill Orblin is on fire this year. He's doing the job in whichever series he's running in. Coming up on a lap car, that's the sister TRG Porsche, the 64 machine. And they clear that okay. Meanwhile, up front, look at Ricky Taylor. Around the outside of Ryan Diala, turn one. That's a power move. The that corner. is a power move, and now he's only got one left on his list. This is the drive that Ricky Taylor needed to get his confidence back, to believe in himself again after several mistakes that got him second-guessing himself. The Ricky Taylor of old is back. Didn't he's think. not old at all. He's only 22. Didn't think he could do it, but he, uh, he did do it. Outside pass. The stage is set for Ricky Taylor to be a hero here at Indy. They've got the star port support. And boy, oh boy, what a day this could be. He took it to Montoya. He took it to DL. Next man in his sights, Bordet. Calvin, I talked to Ricky earlier today about where his head was because of all the problems over the past two months. And he said the testing that they've done has really helped him out. The test here, and then they also tested at Watkins Glen. He said he's really got his head back in this thing. He isn't concerned about the mistakes he had. And I also asked him, with your dad and Max, do you go to those guys and, and have them help you work through your, your head right now and where things are? And he said, well, my dad is great with that, with his experience. But Max, I'd never go to Max. Max just is not helpful in those types of things. <laughs> He was the fastest driver at the official test here at the Brickyard for the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series just a few weeks ago. That was a good sign to launch him into this race meeting. Dial goes for that inside line to make it a little harder for Montoya. Yeah, I'll tell you what, Dial's backpedaling a little bit. He's hanging on, and I'll tell you what, you don't want to be hanging on with someone like Montoya right on the tail because he's trying to hang on for that championship lead here tonight. He's got a three-point margin. He's trying to erase from the man who's just two cars back, Scott Pruitt. Pruitt's getting the job done with the wounded car. Pruitt's getting some pretty good lap times underneath him. Let's switch gears. Let's talk GT. Let's talk Brumos and the 59 team. They're running second at the moment. This has been a spirited drive by Andrew Davis and Lee Keane. Andrew Davis had a great drive early on, handed the car over to Lee Keane. You said we did not need that yellow, and I said, but it allowed you to close in on the 44. 
Does Lee have anything for Andy in front of him? I don't know. Andy's turning it on right now, but then they're just swapping laps back and forth. Uh, Lee's driving exceptionally well. The car's really coming to us at the end here. We're good on fuel. We've got better tires in the 44. We're starting to pull a little gap from the 70, but uh, it's just tight, as always. You've got to be in front of that 44 for this North American Endurance Championship. I know you guys feel like you're out of the, the Drivers' Championship for the year, but the NAEC still up for grabs, but you got to be in front of the 44. What can he do to get past Andy Lally? Well, you know, it's just going to be Lee's is going to have to battle his way up there and find where we're a bit stronger and get by. You know, the, the, the big championship for us is, is, is so far away that we just want to win races. If we win races, then it'll all come to us. We didn't really expect to really fight for this, uh, for this North American Endurance Championship, but with the 57 being, uh, being out and back, it gives us a good chance. So we just got to fight. No quit. They just got to fight. And what a better place to win than the Brickyard. And it's a pretty beaten and torn up 01 <laughs> Telmex Riley BMW that Scott Pruitt is hustling at the moment, but he's doing a fine job in fourth place. He's only 5.9 seconds out of the lead of this race. Let's monitor the margins because Bourdais last time around had four seconds over Ricky Taylor in the starport entry for Wayne Taylor Racing. That's what it looks like there. It's a very healthy margin. It is, but I'll tell you what, Bourdais just ran the fastest lap of the race, a 122.9. So that target for Ricky Taylor is getting tougher. Bergmeister just went off track doors. Yeah, he was paddling really, really hard trying to get by the Mars. Jonathan Bomarito, I think uh, that caught him out. Now he's got Bill Oberlin to worry about. I'll show you what happened to the 66 TRG Porsche. Inside move, outside move. It's got in a little too deep there yeah. down in turn one. Just Saw the really bridge, was working hard, working him over, trying every angle he could. Just cost him a little bit of ground. I'll tell you what could get ugly here today. Jeff Siegel's got the championship on his mind, but he wants to get closer to the front of this pack, and he's got a guy in front of him who hates being passed. Billy Orblin is one of the toughest competitors in the business, and Jeff Siegel's got to think about that. Well, let's think about what kind of a day it could be for Magnus Racing, winning the Rolex 24, and Brian, if they could stay where they are, if Andy Lally can stay where he is, it's just going to be a $50,000 bonus. Yeah, they could go from winning the Rolex 24 to winning the North American Endurance Championship. John Potter is the team principal. John, I'd say Andy's on fire right now, but that's probably not really a good thing to say to you guys. He's having a great run in the 44. He's well aware of where he is and what he needs to do to win the NAEC, correct? Oh, I, I, missed, I missed most of what you said there, but yeah, Andy's well aware, and uh, he's doing a great job out there. We've climbed, uh, climbed a long way this race. Strategy, a lot of great driving, and really the crew who put this car together. Every bolt of this car went on it it's between the last race and this race. So the fact that it's missed made every session is a is a positive thing. Winning the race would be uh, icing on the cake on that. Fifty thousand dollar payday. Does it make up for the fire? Well, that'll be nice. We'll deal with that. Ask me that in fifteen minutes. How about that? Best of luck. Now you can see here a little bit of a skirmish that's gone on between Jordan Taylor and Rui Agua, the Auto House Camaro and the AF Waltrip Ferrari. Oh. And Jordan's going to be a little upset here, I think, because, yeah, I mean, the Ferrari had the line down there, but, I mean, this is a battle for position, not a battle for position, and Ferrari should have just let him go on. And we have just got a report that Dial and Montoya have gone off track. Have they collided? from third and fourth place overall. There's Dial. Oh my goodness. This is massive in the championship. Guys, all the way off on the grass and just keep on me. Wow, he's saying that Montoya was all the way off in the grass in turn two. Looks like, and T-boned him. And this has big implications. Think about the politics of this one. The O2 is a Ganassi car. Pruitt's leading the championship, a Ganassi car. And the O2 takes the closest competitor out. And it's full course caution as a result. Of Ryan being stuck there. Of course, wow. we're saying that based on radio, uh, Ryan's radio communication. Yet to see the replay. Wow. And that's Enzo Potolucchio back there. Furious. His teammate. Side by side. Dial is closest to us. tell where they actually got side by side you know i mean if 
need to see a bit more of the run into yeah, the corner see to see either. what really happens. Certainly Montoya's being super aggressive. We saw that with the nine car. But I'm not sure how much fight Ryan was giving him at the same time. If the O2 is already along the inside, then you've got to probably let him go. But So DL Starworks Ford will be retrieved. But this is massive as far as the North American Endurance Championship. Fortunately, Bourdais drives for the same team, so he could save the day for the team because the highest finishing team car gets the points. But for the big championship, the Rolex Series, this is huge. It's really going to hurt Enzo Potolifio and Ryan Dial. Looking ahead two weeks to the next round of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. It's the short course, short race. It's a two-hour sprint, 6 p.m. Eastern, Saturday, August 11th. We are up there with the NASCAR Nationwide and Sprint Cup Series. It's always an enjoyable weekend, and that race is fast and frantic, and it's at the Glen. Say no more. You can see it live here on Speed. You're joining us here at the Brickyard in a sad and sorry scene for a team and car that has spent a lot of time at the front of this race. A collision between Juan Pablo Montoya and Starworks driver Ryan Dial. And as you can imagine, they are none too pleased at Starworks. Brian Till is there. Yeah, Peter Barron, not pleased at all. And you can understand why, Peter. I know you're just having a word with the officials. What are you looking for from them? You know, that's the thing with this race, the Ganassi bringing in all stars. Montoya is here to do one thing, wreck our race and our championship. He did that. Chip should give him the bonus. That was absolutely terrible what he did. We told the series it was going to happen. We have emails saying Montoya is going to take us out, phone calls, you name it. The entire world knew Montoya was going to take somebody out, and they did. They better make this right. I mean, this is crazy. Peter Barron, I think you're looking to get that. You're getting to, looking to get your your lap back, Peter. They, 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 the series has to make this right. You know, it, it didn't take Nostradamus to tell you Montoya is going to take somebody out, and we're leading. We're right behind him in the championship, and they just ruined our run here. Let's show you again what went down between Juan Pablo Montoya and Ryan Dial. Watch closely. Dial is closest to us here in the white number eight. Montoya on the outside. He has the inside run for the next corner. He doesn't get the power down as well as Dial does, so Dial probably thinks, well, I can swing across, and he's just, I don't know, man. It's, you know, it's a tough one. It's a tough one, but there was room for two cars there. Yeah. You know, it didn't have to happen. It did happen. Montoya's going for it, I think, for Ryan's perspective. You know who you're racing against. We know what one's all about. He's going to give it a million percent. He's got nothing to lose. When he's down the inside of you, do you want to rub doors with him? I'm not saying it's right, but do you have to think, hey, he's going to take me out if I try and force the issue here, and that's what happened. And up front, on a more positive note, it gives young Ricky Taylor a shot at a four-time open-wheel champ in Sebastian Bourdais. Since winning back-to-back -back at Homestead in New Jersey, this car, this team, had a 10th, a 9th, a 7th, and an 11th. It's been a disaster. It's been a nightmare. From spinning, from hitting the pit wall at Detroit, to spinning under caution while leading the race at Road America, to dramas through to more contact at Watkins Glen. Well, this is the salt in the wound for Peter Barron. It's not only taken the eight car out of the action right now, or put it back in the pack. It's also put Ricky Taylor on the tail end of Bourdais. Ready to roll. Green, 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 green at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And Bourdais knows where young Ricky Taylor's going to go. Trying for that inside line. So Ricky takes the Starport Corvette to the outside. And he's done it there before. It's going to be harder this time. Pruitt's looking up the inside too. Oh, Ricky's Taylor's off. wide. Taylor's wide. Pruitt's going to take advantage. Taylor's dropped back a position. Scott Pruitt is... Oh, and contact yeah. there with a nine in the 02. Was that retribution for the hit earlier? I would say so. Yeah. Joao lined him up. Said, hey, remember me? <laughs> Tell you what, Montoya hung on to it. That was a good <laughs> catch. He's not going to have a lot of friends in the pit lane when the checkered flag falls here tonight. Let's show you that one more time. Going down and watch car number nine. Watch nine. He sees 0-2. There's no gap there. 
<laughs> we know what that was all about. The bad thing is Montoya's now two positions in front of him. Yeah. That was a little square up. That was a little payback. Ricky Taylor, I'm going to be keen to see here because he filled that grill with grass. Is that car going to overheat or is that grass being able to disperse as he chases Scott no, Pruitt? It good. looks all right. It he's, looks good. good. And even with six minutes to go, blow the thing up, and you're not going to stop, that's for sure. Remember, the 10 car, nothing to lose. Ricky Taylor has to put it all on the line here. Just over six minutes to go. Bordet is down the road, but he's got to push hard. He has to get around Pruitt down into turn one. Look at that gap on the first flying lap. Bordet is flying. That, that car is, is so incredible. hooked up. He was totally hooked up, and these guys were damaged. Each other. Look at that. This body work on, right. on Pruitt's car. That's from before, I think. I think Beer Bob has finally just let go, and yeah. it's uh, starting to rub the front tire yep now it's getting into that right front that'll be a concern what's going on in gt land remember two classes on the track Ooh. at the one time andy lally under pressure from fellow porsche driver lee keen bomberito's tucked in there has bergmeister clawed his way back yes he has he's still in fourth and back in touch with the guys he's been fighting with for a majority of the time and whoever wins out of these top three cars right here, if one of those three cars takes it to victory lane, they will also win the North American Endurance Championship on top of that. They'll have the point spread. Let's not lose sight of the fact. Bomberito for second. He gets to the inside of Lee Keen and takes the position. Bergmeister goes through as well. Keen tries to come oh, back. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was going to happen. You could see that. Oh, this is going to be yellow. Uh, it's going to bring another yellow for sure. Wow, Lee Keen. Just drove into the side of Jörg Bergmeister. Wow, and Bob Rita just really, that was an awesome move he made to set that up, not the wreck. Five minutes to go. Are they going to be able to retrieve the TRG Porsche and get going in time? So that's down at Starworks. Stefan Pfeiffer in the middle of your screen there, who calls the shots on the two. His man, Sebastian Bourdais, is out in front. Alex Popov is there. Look at this, John Bedell, Lars Giersing, all the guys, John Potter up the far end. That's the Magnus Porsche team. Weird moment for Stefan Pfeiffer because there's great news for him in the two car, but he used to crew chief York Bergmeister with the Flying Lizard squad for many years. They're good pals. It's going to be hanging to see him in the gravel trap, but it may provide the win for their team today. So, Bourdais. In the last two races in this series, he's just made a hero out of himself. Yes, he has done that. I mean, that car is really strong, but he is doing such an incredible job at, at gaining control. Okay, Thank watch this. Here goes the 70 of Bomarito. That's through for second. Now, Lee Keen is getting desperate. He knows that he could lose third. Now, did, did your kind of turn down a little yeah, bit? I, I think what it is, Lee, when you're down that inside where Lee Keen was, you try and take it in deep. You then got to try and turn the car, and, you know, that's going to happen. What a shame. What a run for your Bergmeister. He drove brilliantly. I mean, Bomarito had that set up as a clean pass, but it really did set up the wreck, didn't it? I mean, it, yeah. he wasn't part of it. Just tough racing. It's a tough racetrack to go side by side there into that braking area. We, we are hearing from race control next time by white flag. Get that thing out of there. I want to see this. <laughs> Things remain as is. It's going to be a first win in the Rolex series for Sebastian Bourdais and a first win for his car Did owner, Alex Popov. Not yet. We have one and a half laps to go. It's going to be white flag next time by. You're going to get the white flag next time by. And they're going to keep it under yellow. As it looks right now, and it will stop under caution. So you're going to do one more lap after that, and then you'll get the checker. You may have just heard the front end of that radio transmission Bordet saying, we won the race. And the cool head of Stefan Pfeiffer saying, we have not won the race yet. <laughs> yet. We have in one and a half laps time once they show the white flag. Great performance by Sebastian Bordet, but his teammate did the job too today. Just incredible qualifying performance up in the top five, just a few tens off the pole. Had the fastest race lap on wet tyres there in that early going. Had the lead when he made his pit stop. That was just a brilliant performance by both these guys today. So, a little earlier today, the rain interrupted a continental race was full of <laughs> controversy and craziness. So too is this one, and boy, it's looking good for Andy Lally and Magnus Racing and John Potter. For these guys here, this is a thrilling moment. The number two car in season 2012 has not finished on the podium. So not only are they both going to get their first wins, it's going to be the first podium in a lap's time for those guys.
and big for the North American Endurance Championship for Starworks. Huge for Magnus Racing as well, and that's why they're smiling. One more lap, they're saying. Let's not celebrate yet. One more lap. And who would have bought Scott Pruitt a second place out of that thing that they were running around earlier, you know? Second, and think about with the Al getting turfed around, he's now in seventh spot in class, so Pruitt's going to make up a bag of points and extend the lead tonight in the overall championship with as we showed you before four races remaining on the rolex series schedule it sure didn't look like it was in the cards for that to happen did it no. I mean, not not even that many laps ago with the car all tore up it's been quite an eventful day see alex popov in the background there in the red shirt if after you went over the start finish lane i think the I'm not sure if the safety car is going to stay out or what, but you got to go go around one more time uh, and then start at the start finish. I mean, stop at the start finish. Just communication, just telling Sebastian Bourdais what needs to be done. He and Alex Popov are going to get to kiss the bricks. <laughs> How cool is that? It is very cool. And so too Andy Lally and John Potter. And as we kind of set up throughout this race, in the situations and scenarios in both Daytona Prototype and GT. It's a winner-take-all situation, just the way the points are stacked in the North American Endurance Championship. Starworks will win the Daytona Prototype side of things. And Magnus, this Porsche coming through here, the grey and white car, the car that almost burnt to the ground at Watkins Glen a month ago. It's a new tub. They've got to freshen up. They're going to take the GT side of the North American Endurance Championship, the inaugural North American Endurance Championship. The three-round series that pays a bonus of $100,000 and $50,000 to the DP and GT classes, respectively. I'm glad we're showing the happy side of pit lane because there's <laughs> yeah. going to be another side, I'm afraid, here yeah. shortly. Pruitt, what a day to come through a finish second. He's going to add eight points to that championship lead that stood at three. I believe they're going to have an 11 point lead tonight. There's Alex Popov right in the middle. There's John Maddox from Roush Yates Engines, who supply the Ford engines to Starworks. This is huge. Ford wins the Rolex 24 at Daytona with Mike Shank Racing. Ford's going to win the North American Endurance Championship with Starworks. Just a fantastic story. We never like to see races finish under yellow, but we do like to see superstars like Sebastian Bourdais come to the Rolex series. <laughs> He never got the win in the 500, but he gets the win here at the Brickyard in Grand Am. Sebastian Bourdais, Alex Popov, victorious at the first ever Rolex Series race at Indianapolis. And well done to Magnus Racing as well. Porsche goes to victory lane. They win the Rolex 24 at Daytona. They win at the Brickyard as well. Magical stuff for Magnus. Andy Lally and John Potter. A day to remember at Indy. There we go. Whilst he went on the streets of surfers last year, Lee, as the guest driver of the eight supercars, but he's been having a bit of a lean time in Indy cars. Here we see Andy Lally in a challenging year for these guys, too. So when they hung their head in their hands and saw their car burning, at Watkins Glen, did they ever imagine they'd be celebrating in victory lane at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway? Why not? That's the way the Rolex series rolls. Unpredictable. And we've got it all. The wrap up. When we come back, we're going to hear from our winners. Ready to celebrate here at Indy, but before we do, we need to show you the eHarmony moves of the race and Seabass, Sebastian Bourdais, just unbelievable in his race. That one there was with Memo Rojas. This one here was with Juan Pablo Montoya. Nobody was going to get in the way of the Frenchman. The four-time Champ Car Series champion. That was on Joao Barbosa. And this one on his Starworks teammate Ryan Dial around the outside of turn one. Just power moves, the car was hooked up. Sebastian had the rhythm around this racetrack and takes the victory along with his teammate Alex Popov. What a great day here at Indy. Celebrations, and we're going to join them in just a moment. But first, let's snapshot the results for you. First ever win in the series for Popov and for Bourdais. For Rojas and Pruitt, they consolidate their uh, position at the top of the championship with their sixth podium of the year and a good rebound race for Angelelli and Taylor. We're going to show you GT results in a minute, but first, Chris Neville. Chris?
Well, Sebastian Bourdais finally gets his helmet off down here, giving his teammate a hug, Alex Papa. You know, guys, when you think about the names that have won here in NASCAR Sprint Cup, in Formula One, in the Indy 500, Alex, you get your first sports car win at the Brickyard. Well, it was it's amazing. You know, it's a dream come true. We knew it since we came to the test. It was a one-day test for us. This guy did an amazing job. I drove my, you know, the best I've ever driven in, in, in sports car this race. I, I like the track. It was amazing. It was a feeling like, you know, I knew since the beginning that we have something for this and we're going for it. And this guy finished it and, and we are happy to be here and be the first one to win this race. Sebastian, you've tried to win here in the Indy 500. You've come up short, but you win here in the very first Brickyard Grand Prix. Yeah, that was a, a pretty sweet uh, achievement. I'm really, really happy for the boys. And, uh, you know, they, like Alex said, the car was really switched on from the test, and uh, I knew we were going to have a shot, but to put it together is awesome. Well, he passed his teammate. He had a lot of pressure from the SunTrust team, but Sebastian Bourdais, he kept it out front. Lee? Uh, just showing what a quality driver he is, whether it's open wheel, whether it's sports cars, just fantastic. All right, let's turn our attention to GT, and then we have it a Porsche on top over the Mazda, and then the 59 Brumos machine, followed by Turner, and then the championship leaders in the top five, Asentado and Siegel, doing what they need to do, Dorse, to take another step closer to being a champion again. Yeah, it's a fact. It looked like a Porsche 123, but not to be outdone. Bomberito, really great job getting in there. All those guys, Bill Oberlin, good job there at the finish. Time to celebrate in GT land. Let's join the Magnus crew. Here's Brian. Now, congratulations all around down here. The congratulations you would expect with a race win at Indianapolis. John Potter, we spoke a little bit earlier. Now you can celebrate that 50 grand that we were talking about but there's plenty to talk about today we'll talk about that in a little while let's talk right now about this race win when you guys started off the season with the win at the rolex 24 that was special but when you add another victory and it comes at the indianapolis motor speedway how special is that for this team oh it's a very special you know what's funny about this race is i probably felt more anxiety sitting on that pit box than at the 24 and i'm trying to figure out why it's i mean one it's the history of this place but also after 24 hours you're so exhausted you're just like let's just finish it this it's just like it was down to the end with all those cautions it was a neat race and I, but I gotta say again too, uh, the crew over here just did such a good job bringing this car back from the dead that uh, it really goes to them. We're just here tooling around, so. Andy Lally, I've, I can't even remember how long I've known you. I think back to watching you when you first came into racing, an open wheel guy, you said, I wanna run at the Speedway. But you have now and you've won at the Speedway, maybe not in the 500, but you've taken this victory. It was hard fought today. How special is it to you as a driver when you think about the history that you've had to be able to say on my resume, I've won at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's it's Indianapolis and you've won and you know, I, I, we did it here. My mom's over in the corner here watching it. I, I, uh, Lars came on the radio said we're gonna end our new yellow we won the brickyard and I was just like I it didn't hit me until then and I actually I got choked up in the car but Johnny did a great job Lars uh, John Bedell all these guys at Magnus Racing I you wouldn't believe what they just did in the last week to get this car ready <sighs> you guys I'm a fortunate guy and uh, um, we won Indy congratulations Andy Lally he's one of the stars of the Rolex sports car series and he and John Potter have formed a really solid partnership this in their very first year well, you know what happens when you win at Indy? You get to do something special. And it looks like this. You get to kiss the bricks. Sebastian Bourdais, Alex Popov, and team owner Peter Barron. They celebrate. You know what? The big championship, that gets decided at Lime Rock Park later in the year. Right here, right now, it's about the North American Endurance Championship. And we're going to crown our winners when we come back to wrap things up from the Brickyard. Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is presented on speed by Rolex. Brought to you in part by Continental Tire. Innovative technology, driving confidence. And there was plenty of confidence across the yard of bricks here today. We've seen the DP boys do it. Now it's time for Magnus Racing on the GT side of things. John Potter and Andy Lally and the team joining them as well. Just marvellous scenes and wonderful memories for them for the rest of their lives. We're still live here from the Brickyard as we wrap things up. But first, as I mentioned before the break, we have to crown our champions in the inaugural North American Endurance Championship. This three round series, Daytona, Watkins Glen, and here at the Brickyard, and Starworks have done it. How about that? Action Express held the lead coming into this race.
but Starworks took it with thanks to Bourdais and Popov. They did it with the two cars. It was the eight car that got the big points at Daytona and at the Glen. Today it was the two cars. Well, you need a two car team to win this championship. Otherwise, those Ganassi boys may have snuck in there. And let's switch pages to GT. And as we said, it was a winner take all affair today with Starworks and with Magnus winning by six over Speed Source. Good consistency there, but spare a thought for Stevenson. They had a healthy lead coming into today, but it did not go their way with either car at the Stevenson group. So a tough one for them, but great for Magnus and Chris Neville standing by with uh, both DP and GT winning team owners. Yeah, Lee, you talk about that championship, the North American Endurance Championship, presented by Visit Florida. We've got Susanna Costello, the brand manager, down here to congratulate both of these teams. John Potter, the team owner for Magnus, and Peter Barron, team owner for Starworks. Peter, let's start with you. What, what, what a great day. You, you, you beat up on some of the, the biggest teams out there. You had a tough time with Juan Pablo Montoya. Yeah. You had that frustration, but you not only win the race with the two car, you win this championship and $100,000 shot. No, that, that, that's awesome. You know, it's such a cool thing to have Visit Florida behind us, and we're a Florida team, so super proud as, uh, as the Florida community and everything. And, uh, you know, the guys and everything, it was nice to spread it across a couple cars, both the eight and the two car contributed. And it's really just an honor. We've been having an incredible year. You know, with uh, wins at Sebring, you know, Le Mans, and, and now at Indy, and you know, well, how, how much better can this year get? And John Potter, looking at the GT standings today, it looked like Stevenson probably had this thing wrapped up, but it didn't go their way. And you guys have had a tough summer. You're coming back from that fire. You get the win and the championship and $50,000. Yeah, well, when we started this season, the goal was to win the full season here. And we unfortunately had a few things go wrong for us, and we couldn't do that. But this ain't bad, so I'll take it. You know, it's, a, it's a lot of great competitors out there, and, um, and Stevenson had a heartbreak too. But um, we're happy to be there, and it's an amazing thing. Well, what a great day. Our first Brickyard Grand Prix. Not only do the winners of the Grand Prix win it, they also win the North American Endurance Championship. Lee? And there's that beautiful trophy in the background for the first time. So terrific stuff there. And there are the cars that did the job here at the Brickyard. Peter Barron's Ford-powered Starworks Riley. And then, of course, the Magnus Racing Porsche with that new tub that did it today just perfect and there is that trophy again we say thanks to inspired bronze uh, incorporated of deland florida and humphrey and sons jewelers who manufactured that trophy created that wonderful trophy for this inaugural championship fantastic and susanna costello the brand manager for visitflorida.com bringing us and presenting the north american endurance championship well that's the three round championship what about the 13 round championship that is the rolex sports car series brian till you're standing by with some guys who still lead the way yeah they do and uh, you know to some extent who would have thunk it because the old one certainly had problems today memo we talked uh, after you got out of the car a little bit i know you were angry at yourself but when you look at what this team has done yeah, it's got to kind of make you smile inside yeah, it was pretty good it was probably one of the craziest races we've had in a long time um wet dry driver changes, um, people crashing to either, each other. Um, I got a tap from Burde on, on that last um, restart and um, fortunately got off uh, to the marbles. And then when I got to the banking, I couldn't keep it in line uh, next to the, the, the GT car was coming up on me. And uh, fortunately we, we uh, kind of rubbed the ball, the, the wall a little bit. Luckily the car, the Riley chassis was really strong and it basically it's just bodywork damage because the car was drivable and the team did a great job to put it back together and uh, Scott to finish the race. We got a second place, which is pretty good for the championship. Yeah, it is very good for the championship. They'll extend their points lead in the championship. And like you said, if you can't win here at the Brickyard, maybe there's another championship in store for Ganassi. What a wild day for those boys, but that's what they do best in the 01. They just hang in there. You heard the term dodge a bullet? <laughs> yeah, that was it. That was Woo! it. Dodge machine gun is what My that was. goodness, that was unbelievable. They came back for second place finish and increase their lead in the championship. What a day for them. Wrap it up for us, Dawes. What are your thoughts? Well, I didn't think a win in here would be this hard. I mean, it doesn't come easy, but they were throwing everything that could be thrown at them today to get the win. I want to see what Montoya Montoya's going to have dinner with tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pretty Mom. wild day. We had literally a little bit of everything. And after this collision, they hang on to finish second and keep this lead in the Rolex Sports Car Championship. Well, we've been talking about this day for a long time for the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series to come to the Brickyard. I think we got one to remember. Thanks for watching Sports Cars on Speed. We'll see you in two weeks from the Glen.